All right, I'm going to call this meeting of the Interim Judiciary Committee uh, to order. Um, I'm going to make my remarks first before we get to the rule because I understand we are having some technical difficulties connecting with all of our members, but I didn't want that to delay us um, any more than it already has. Our hardworking BPS staff is on the case. Um, it is entirely the fault of our legislators. No, I'm kidding. Um, it's just one of those things that happens. So um, for those of you who are new to the Interim Judiciary Committee, welcome. For those of you who have been here before, welcome back. Um, I do want to mention a couple of things that those of you who have been here before already know. Um, but one of the great things about judiciary is we have new faces and new people here um, every time. So um, the Interim Judiciary Committee has a lot of work to do, and our meetings are a little bit long. Uh, you can expect that we will be here into the early afternoon. So there will be a lunch break uh, sometime around noon. We'll kind of keep an eye on the calendar and the clock and find a time between presentations that make sense. To that end, um, if any, I have talked to some of the presenters already who asked to go earlier in the meeting so they can make it to um, other commitments that they have. If any of the other presenters have um, scheduling issues, please feel free to reach out to me or to the staff who scheduled you today, even while presentations are going on and we can shuffle the schedule. Um, even if you wanna come later, so you can leave and come back to the meeting to present, we can absolutely accommodate that. Um, also, the members of the committee know this, so I want the presenters of the committee to know that we don't really take breaks in between, which is why um, members are absolutely free to stand up, take a break, go grab a snack, whatever they need to do, and I ask that our presenters please, please don't take offense to that. Realize that they may have been sitting here for hours <laughs> without a break. Um, and when they come back, if they missed just a portion of the presentation, they might ask questions to catch up. If they missed an entire presentation, then we ask them to uh, watch that online and follow up with you later. Um, in case anybody's unfamiliar with the process that we go through, um, you'll see on our agenda item that everything is listed as a presentation. So we have people here who are going to provide us with some awesome information on the types of policy work that we are doing in the Judiciary Committee. Um, presenters will come up to the table either here in Carson City down in Las Vegas or come to the proverbial table on the internet um, after the presentation from each organization, um, committee members have a chance to ask questions, and um, then we move on to the next presentation. And we also have two opportunities for public comment during uh, the Senate, sorry, the Joint Interim Judiciary Committee, uh, one at the beginning of the meeting, one at the end of the meeting. Public comments are limited to three minutes per person. And we also have um, the opportunity to present written comments. So if you have something that exceeds three minutes, absolutely submit it to our staff and we will include that in the record and um, online. And I encourage all of the members of the committee to read those in, in their entirety. I always do. Um, which reminds me, if you're following along at home, all of the documents, all of the presentations that we're looking at are available on the Interim Judiciary Committee website. They're listed as attachments or um, items for this meeting. Um, that's how you can navigate to them. And I think that is everything for now. Um, and I will go ahead and ask our secretary to call the roll, please. Senator Harris. Senator Pickard. Oh, I understand oh. Senator Harris is present and experiencing technical difficulties with her mic, which I swear I did not do on purpose. <laughs> uh, we will get it fixed before um, we get to questions and stuff. But Marker is present, please. Senator Pickard. I am here. Assemblywoman Krasner. Here. Assemblywoman Marzola. Here. Assemblywoman Wynn. If you can just mark Assemblywoman Wynn present when she arrives. Assemblyman O'Neill. Here. Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Present. Chair Scheibel. Here. Thank you so much. And that brings us into um, our first public comment period of uh, this meeting. Is there anybody wishing to give public comment in person in Carson City? Don't see anybody coming up to the table, so we will go down to anybody in person in Las Vegas. 
and I do see somebody coming up to the table. I forgot to mention, in case you're new here, that when you get to the table, you have to press the microphone button in order for your comments to be recorded. And please just uh, state your name at the beginning of any comments that you make, both in public comment and during presentations, because that's how we're able to take accurate minutes that reflect the person who is speaking. Please go ahead. So Katrina grigsby Thefford. Um, <clears throat> This public comment is for the Sentencing Commission. Um, prison reentry services are vital to ensure that individuals recently released from prison are provided with resources and support to assist with stable housing, income, social skills, and health. Reentry services should start first and foremost with, with housing. Under AB 236, um, it states that it's expected um, to reduce uh, incarceration rates through a number of different changes to sentencing and release policies to avoid $640 million in correctional costs over the 10 years uh, following its enactment. One of the things that AB 236 uh, states it will do is minimize barriers to successful reentry. Um, under NRS 176-01343, it states that the commission is um, required to track and assess many different data points, um, identifying gaps in the criminal justice system, data tracking and recommendations. And I am suggesting that housing status is a data point that is tracked. Um, national research states that 15% of incarcerated people uh, experienced homelessness in the year before admission to prison, and formerly incarcerated people are almost 10 times more likely to be homeless than the general public. So tracking the housing status at entry and exit and assessing that data to determine how homelessness plays a role in recidivism will also help reach this goal of decreasing prison costs and minimizing um, <clears throat> any barriers to successful reentry. So I suggest creating a Nevada reentry housing work group, which I'm actively working on. Um, it's the work group will be responsible for constructing guidance around how Nevada should properly track and share information in order to gauge the statistics of how many homeless individuals enter prison, how many individuals who are experiencing homelessness are part of that recidivism number, and to ask and uh, recommend that housing status is added um, as a data point to be collected and shared with uh, the Sentencing Commission under AB 236. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in Las Vegas uh, wishing to make public comment in person? I don't see any, so um, we will move to the phone lines and the internet. Is there anybody on the phone wishing to make public comment. If you wish to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christine Saunders. That's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S. -E -E and I'm a policy director with the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada and one of the founding organizations of the Nevada Housing Justice Alliance. First, we want to thank you for taking up today's conversation in regards to summary evictions. During the legislative session, PLAN and almost 30 other organizations submitted a letter to the Assembly Judiciary Committee on Assembly Bill 161, which initially would have banned summary evictions but was then amended into a study. I want to share some of those comments with you again today. We believe every Nevadan, deserve, every Nevadan deserves an affordable and stable place to call home. Yet our already existing housing crisis has only been exacerbated by the pandemic. According to the American Community Survey, in 2019, almost 44% of Nevada households were renters, much higher than the national average of 36%. Nevada also boasts the distinction of being the only state that allows for summary eviction. This is a provision that allows landlords to entirely sidestep the judicial system when trying to evict residents from their home and places the burden on tenants to initiate a court case should they hope to have the due process of a court hearing and judicial oversight afforded to tenants everywhere else in this country. Evictions and economic displacement impact us all by putting more economic burden on our communities through the increased demands on social services, shelters, and hospitals by families who become homeless 
and other costs associated with the disruption caused by housing instability. By contrast, stable homes promote educational opportunity for children and economic opportunities for families, allowing Nevadans to save for a house, pursue new employment, and open new businesses. During the past two years, our coalition has conducted community outreach, put out educational training on tenant laws, assisted in filing for CAPS, and in responding to summary eviction notices. However, far too many times when a tenant was finally able to be connected with us for support, the time had run out on their summary eviction. This is inexcusable. We must take this moment to work together to make real transformational change for a more fair and just Nevada. Our coalition will remain an active stakeholder participant in the continued conversations on the impacts of eviction and housing instability on Nevadans. Thank you. Good morning, Tanya Brown, Advocates for the Inmates and the Innocent. Good morning, Chair Scheibel and members of the committee. Um, on April 8, uh, 2022, um, I attempted to make a second public comment. However, for some unknown reason, I was unable to participate, even though I had pressed nine and was now in the queue. I'd like to give my um, public comment for the April's public comment now. Um, we would like to see funding set aside for the 2023 legislation to go towards funding NDOC so that they could implement a mental health PTS program prior to their release to allow inmates to seek programming treatment for their PTSD who have acquired during um, their duration of incarceration. And we'd also like to see ongoing treatment for inmates who will still remain incarcerated and are not able to be paroled or whose parole will be coming up in the future. This is an ongoing problem. People coming out of the uh, prison suffer from PTSD. They would like to have this prior to coming out. Also under the agenda item seven, um, I have concerns um, when, it comes, um, when it comes to evictions, um, when it is out of the control of the renter but it falls directly on to the owner of the property for non-payment of taxes. And unbeknownst to the renter, the county has begun legal action, leaving the renter with no place to go. This is something that I did not see, but it has come up. And so um, I just wanted to let you know. Thank you and have a great day. Hello, my name is Erica Minaberry. That's E R I K A M I N A B E R R Y. And I am here testifying on behalf of my children who are once again about to be homeless as we have just received another eviction notice for um, basically no cause. In 2019, I testified that I had relinquished custody of my children because I did not have housing. And I was begging all of the legislatures to please listen to the people that are struggling the most. During the next legislative session, I am once again begging everyone that has any iota of power to please consider the weight of consequences when talking about what is fair in law. I don't know of any landlord or any developer that has to be separated from their children or any land owner or any, any developer who has had to go hungry because of uh, rent control or because of, you know, not having to go through evictions so quickly, whereas us here down on the bottom, we are suffering major, major trauma because of what is happening with this housing crisis. Please think about us first. We are the ones that are experiencing the heaviest consequences. And um, also, since I got the eviction, I would like to say that even though I am now graduated college and making a living wage, I am still unable to find housing. That is one third of my income. And every single application that I put in so far has asked whether or not I was a felon. Personally, I am not. 
but had I made one mistake in my life, I would, I guess, forever be permanently banned from being in society in any meaningful way. So please, please, please help us. Please, please, please make this change. We need it so bad. Everyone needs it so bad. Don't think about the developers. Don't think about the the landowners. They're doing okay, and we're not. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Scheibel and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mary Walker, M-A-R-Y-W-A-L-K-E-R, representing Douglas County, Lyon County, and Story County. We just wanted to comment on the committee discussion at the April 8th committee meeting regarding the implementation of AB 424, the 48-hour threshold for pretrial release hearings. We concur with the excellent presentation by Judge Stephen Bishop regarding how difficult the implementation of AB 424 is having in rural Nevada, particularly for the judges, court staff, district attorneys, public defenders, interpreters, and sheriff staff. The main issue is these folks who have dedicated their careers to serving justice are now being required to work six to seven days a week. There's already talk of retirement and we are concerned whether we will be able to find qualified people to serve in these positions. I also wanted to thank Senator Harris for her question to Judge Bishop regarding how we fix some of these problems. Thank you, Senator, for the question and your and the committee's continued work on finding solutions. We do support Judge Bishop's comment that to fix the problems, we need to change the statute to 48 business hours. We believe this will provide a reasonable standard in Nevada while eliminating much of the problems. Thank you, Chair Scheibel and members of the committee for your consideration of this important topic. Take care. For those who have just joined, to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place. Thank you. Once again, if you wish to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place. Thank you. Chair, your line is open and working, but at this time, there are no further callers to provide public comment. All right, thank you so much. That will bring us then to agenda item number three. Uh, we have some presentations I'm very excited about, um, and they come right on time on the heels of these public comments about um, our implementation of bills from the 2021 session. Um, I think up first we have Amber Widgery uh, with us, who's the program principal for the criminal justice program with the National Conference of State Legislatures. And we're so excited to have you here and hear more about NCSL's work in uh, the criminal justice program and on bail reform. So whenever you are ready, please uh, go ahead. Thanks so much. I'll just take a moment here and get my screen share going. Okay, we could, good shape. I think you can see the slides and I think you can hear me. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, Chair Scheibel, members of the committee, thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. Um, my name is Amber Widgery, as said, and I work with the National Conference of State Legislatures uh, here in Denver. For those who might not be familiar with NCSL, um, we are the nation's bipartisan nonprofit organization for all 7,383 state lawmakers and more than 30,000 legislative staff across the country. We have offices in Denver and DC, and among our goals is to provide legislatures with information on public policy. And so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the pretrial release process and specifically timelines for that process across the 50 states. I'm gonna cover the current status of this issue in the states. And I'm also gonna be talking about some recent state actions 
focused on um, efficiency and ensuring the pretrial release process happens in a timely manner. Um, I'm also going to sort of cross-reference in my presentation in a couple of areas. We have Angela Darcy with us today from Kentucky Pretrial Services, um, and so she's going to be adding some information and context as well. So first, I just want to note that there are various sources of law that impact pretrial processing and timelines. We have U.S. Supreme Court um, case interpretation of the basic constitutional requirements in terms of prompt pretrial procedures, but I'm going to leave that for um, Angela Darcy to cover in just a little bit. And what I'm really going to cover today are those state timelines set out in state law where they are specified and also what happens at initial appearances impacted by those timelines. Um, I'm also going to be addressing some of the ways that states release individuals prior to that first appearance, because that can also be a strategy um, that we've seen in a number of states. Um, and also, again, states working towards that timely first appearance. So the first thing I want to point out is that procedures provided for in state law really vary from state to state. Uh, the source of law also varies. In some states, it's court ruled it's determinative, uh, and so state Supreme Courts are often in charge of making those determinations. And in other states, it's state legislation and statute that really is determinative and the key source of law. There's also a lot of variation in the terminology that is used in state law. The first appearance of a defendant before court after arrest goes by many names, including some of those listed here on the screen, um, including arraignment, presentment, first appearance, initial 48-hour hearings, preliminary appearance, and more. The list goes on. Um, also, what happens at those hearings really varies by state. Um, so obviously we're here today talking about those initial pretrial release decisions, but a lot of states combine those release decisions with other functions as well. Um, so the setting of bond, but also probable cause hearings, advisement of rights, appointment of counsel, or advisement of that initial advisement of charges as well. So big picture, what does it look like across the 50 states? Almost half the states don't actually provide any sort of specific timeline in statute or in court rule for that initial appearance. Instead, they use much broader and more generic timelines, such as prompt, without delay, uh, within a reasonable time frame, or as soon as is practicable. States that do specify a timeline for that initial appearance and setting of release conditions have adopted time frames anywhere between 24 hours and 72 hours. Um, I should also note that in a number of states, those timelines, that 48-hour timeline or 24-hour timeline, include um, tolling or exclusions for either holidays or um, weekends as well, so that there's some variety across the states there as to whether or not they're including holidays or weekends within their specified timeline. And then we also have a handful of states, sort of the very small minority of states that specify their timeline based on sessions of court. Uh, so the first appearance has to happen at the next available session of court. And those sessions um, are sort of determined by the judicial branch and that can mean the timeline can vary. So now I really want to talk in about some of the ways that states authorize either quicker release before first appearance or support sort of a timeline for that first appearance hearing um, happening in a timely manner. So across the states, there are a variety of ways that defendants can be released before that initial appearance hearing. Um, and you'll see some general examples on this slide, but I'm going to mention and highlight a few states specifically. Um, and I can certainly follow up with statutory provisions or bill numbers if that's of interest. And I'm also happy to connect you to colleagues in other states. Um, so some of these release mechanisms, like you'll see bond schedules on here, are not new concepts, but they have been retained in some states as states move away from utilizing financial conditions of release more broadly. Um, and they've been retained so that if the bond schedule results in a defendant being released more quickly than if they were to go through that individualized hearing and consideration of release conditions uh, by a court. So there's sort of that dichotomy. And I'll give some examples of that here in a minute. So first, I just wanted to mention uh, the first example is Nebraska, where Nebraska state law requires county judges by a majority to vote to adopt a bail schedule. And the focus there is on misdemeanor defenses and also you know, other offenses determined necessary uh, by those local judges. That same state law provision authorizes the sheriff or other peace officer to release defendants pursuant to that schedule before a defendant's first appearance. 
If a defendant is not able to obtain release within 24 hours through that bond schedule, they are then entitled to a review of the conditions and that bond amount on the first regular court day. Counsel is assigned for those review hearings for those who are indigent. And Nebraska law also requires that the presiding judge in some of the more populous counties in the state schedule at least one judge to be on call for addressing release of defendants when court is not in session. California law, like Nebraska, also requires the adoption of a bail schedule at the local level um, in release eligible felony cases and also certain domestic violence misdemeanors, a peace officer with reasonable cause to believe the scheduled amount of bail is insufficient to ensure appearance or safety of the victim can petition the court to increase bail. And inversely, defendants through counsel or even the statute list friends and family can apply to a magistrate to lower the scheduled amount of bail um, or authorize release on recognizance. If there's no order making the change, um, either to increase by petition or reduce by petition the amount of bail or release on recognizance, um, then the defendant is then, you know, within an eight hour time frame, entitled to the scheduled amount um, and able to be released on that scheduled amount of bail. Uh, California, the sort of second piece of this beyond schedules, California is also authorizing predetermined bail amounts that attach to warrants um, and then authorizes officers in charge of local jails to accept bail amounts that are specified on warrants. Colorado is the next example I want to address, and they're probably the state that has done the most to address this recently. Um, so for certain petty traffic and municipal cases, Colorado law allows release on monetary conditions, but only prior to that ind individual first hearing and consideration of release by either a court or a bond commissioner. Now, normally financial conditions of release have been prohibited in these cases. So if a defendant is not released prior to their first appearance and they end up going before a court or a bond commissioner, um, the court and the bond commissioner are not actually able to assign financial conditions of release in those cases. However, if being released on the bond schedule through a financial condition of release is quicker, um, then defendants are able to bond out using those fiscal uh, bail schedules. Colorado is also another example of states that authorize setting a fiscal condition where we have um, arrest with a warrant. So if somebody fails to appear, they can set specified um, financial conditions of release, even if the financial conditions wouldn't be authorized in that sort of first instance of a hearing before um, a judicial officer or that bond commissioner. So I've talked a little bit about bond schedules, which are not necessarily new, but they're being retained in some states as they move away from fiscal conditions. I've also talked a little bit about warrants. I want to move on now to talk about non-court officials, including sheriffs and bond commissioners, who've been empowered uh, to make release determinations in a couple of states. Um, so Utah, by state law, authorizes their local county executive uh, to appoint one or more, and this is the quote from the statutory language, responsible and discreet members of the sheriff's department to serve as bail commissioners, end quote. Uh, bail commissioners in Utah are authorized to release selected individuals on their own recognizance, and they can also determine um, and receive financial conditions of release in both misdemeanor cases and also some lower classes of felony cases. Um, state law provides maximum monetary bond amounts that can be set by commissioners, and those are designated for each class of offense, whether it's misdemeanor or the lowest, lower level felonies. Um, and the ability for commissioners to set release conditions in some felony cases, all this was just recently expanded in 2021 legislation um, in Utah to really empower um, those local bail commissioners to um, expedite release in cases um, and in, in more cases than was previously authorized under Utah law. I'm also going to bring up Colorado again. In 2019, Colorado's legislature enacted the Prompt Pretrial Liberty and Fairness Act, which did a couple of things. It provided that defendants must be allowed to post bond within two hours after the sheriff receives the bond information from the court. It also provides that the custodian of the jail must release the defendant within four hours of a defendant posting bond and once they're physically present in the jail if they're coming back from court. There are some exceptions to that for you know, certain circumstances, um, emergencies, and also if a defendant has had electronic monitoring ordered and they need a little bit more time to process the electronic monitoring. 
Uh, the law also required the chief judge of each judicial district to develop a plan for setting bond in, for all in custody defendants within 48 hours of arrest. The law required the development of cost estimates for each judicial district as well to determine the feasibility for each district in meeting a 48 hour timeline. It required also notes of any savings that would result from the proposal and the proposed 48 hour timeline, including jail bed costs and savings. The administrative office of the court was required to report their findings about the feasibility to the legislature and also specifically note the resources that would be required in those local judicial districts in order to achieve the 48 hour requirement. Legislation was introduced in 2020 and Colorado had a bit of a delayed session related to the pandemic. Um, so legislation was reintroduced on the 48 hour timeline in 2021 and it was enacted, House Bill 1280. Um, and that further revised the timeline. So that initial two hour and four hour timeline were eliminated sort of after the experience and implementation. And instead the new law revised those timelines to be requiring of release within six hours after conditions have been met or recognizance, recognizance bond has been set and the defendant returns to jail. So now focusing on the 48 hour piece of the timeline, the law provides the defendants have the right to counsel at bond hearings. And now the state is you know, not just investigating the 40 hour, 48 hour timeline, they're now requiring bond hearings to be held within 48 hours of an arrestee's arrival at jail. And that implementation started in April of this year. Um, to facilitate this, the act creates the position of a bond hearing officer who is a magistrate um, housed centrally at, within the state judicial branch. And these officers conduct bond hearings on weekends and holidays throughout the state utilizing audiovisual technology. Um, these officers are prioritized, their services are prioritized um, for rural judicial districts specifically who have sort of lower level staffing um, and may not have uh, the ability to hold court as often to be able to make these release determinations. So the bond hearing officer conducts these hearings throughout the states and counties that request the services um, the public is able to access and view these hearings virtually online. Um, for each case heard by this centralized state bond hearing officer, the arresting jurisdiction is responsible for electronically transmitting the arrest report, any pretrial services information if it exists, and all other relevant information that that bond hearing officer needs for that hearing. The act also addresses funding for this, and so it creates the district attorney assistance uh, for bond hearing grant program to assist smaller district attorney's offices in rural areas in particular in covering the costs associated with attending and preparing for these new virtual hearings on weekends and holidays. There's also new funding appropriated for the judicial branch, the public defender's office, which is showing up as counsel at these hearings now, and also the division of criminal justice. Um, in addition to Colorado's use of audiovisual technology, I also just wanted to mention that we saw one other sort of technology um, component in another state, Hawaii, in a 2019 piece of legislation, um, created a statewide system for authorizing the posting of monetary bond amounts 24-7 online. So um, not necessarily providing those hearings on a different timeline, but creating a technological solution for, you know, in a timely manner, any time of day posting fiscal bond amounts online. As I mentioned, I'm happy to follow up with connections to folks in these states or with specific bill information. Uh, but for now, I'll move on to my next slide. And I'm mostly going to let um, Angie talk about this, but I just wanted to mention that pretrial services agencies can also assist with these sort of timelines and processing of pretrial cases. Uh, Kentucky is one of a handful, a small handful of states that have centralized uh, statewide agencies that can help facilitate pretrial services, particularly in rural areas, since that's a centralized statewide resource. And then outside of those states with centralized agencies, the majority of states have at least a few jurisdictions that are utilizing pretrial services programs to some degree. And then we've also seen a fair amount of state legislation requiring, encouraging, or providing grant funds to incentivize uh, the development of local pretrial programs. I also just wanted to highlight the growing role of citations and summonses in lieu of arrest and warrant um, to help folks avoid the pretrial booking and release process altogether. Every state has a law authorizing the use of citations and 
for some type of offense. And then there are at least seven states that provide general authorization without any sort of specific you know, definition of only misdemeanors or in these certain cases, it's more about officer discretion and law enforcement agency policy. Um, and I mentioned this because citations were really a significant tool for many jurisdictions responding to the pandemic to reduce the number of individuals that were booked into jail and actually underwent the pretrial process. So some local jurisdictions, including those, there's some good data from the Safety and Justice Challenge, um, jurisdictions engaged showing the reduction of bookings um, through expanded use of citations. Los Angeles County, for example, in early 2020, was able to drop their daily bookings from 300 down to 60. Um, so I just highlight this as another sort of upstream um, option that local jurisdictions are pursuing and that we've seen a lot more recent state legislative guidance encouraging expanded use of citations uh, so that fewer folks are being booked into jail in the first instance. And with that, I will stop. I'm happy to take questions, um, but I know Angela Darcy will also have additional information as well. Thank you so much, Ms. Widgery. I think I am gonna pause for a moment for questions, um, but then also allow members of the community to go back and ask you questions once we have heard from Ms. Darcy. So let me start now with um, any questions up here in Carson City? All right. Um, any questions down in Las Vegas? I'm not seeing anybody jump in, but please jump if you um, have a question. I did see a hand from Senator Pickard. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair Scheibel. I just uh, wanted to ask a question on the last uh, uh, set of points that you made uh, with respect to the citations, because I've been getting mixed uh, messages from media and other sources where, uh, particularly in California, uh, uh, where in LA and San Francisco, we saw those citations used uh, pretty significantly, and yet crime rates went up and, and people tried to connect those to, well, these people weren't put in jail. Um, I, I don't know what to believe because everybody's saying different things. Is there any data that suggests in a reliable way that uh, uh, the citations worked and didn't actually put people back out on the street that uh, shouldn't have been? Thank you, Chair Scheibel and Senator Pickard. That's a great question. Um, and I don't have the data at my fingertip, but I do have just, data that I would be more you, than happy to share with you. And um, if you can give your from name. LA County. Sorry, I need to put your name on the record. I know it's unnatural. Oh. Amber Widry with ACSL. Yep. Apologies. So apologies, Chair. Um, I'm happy to provide some of that data for you where it exists in jurisdictions like Charleston County, South Carolina, um, or some of those other jurisdictions. So I can definitely follow up. Yeah, I would really like to see uh, uh, the data from the districts that really used it, right? Uh, if we have jurisdictions that only used it a little bit or they didn't uh, really reduce their uh, intake numbers significantly, I don't know that the data will be all that instructive. But where we're talking about, like in LA, as you mentioned, we went from 300 bookings down to 60. Uh, I, I, I think where we see a, a large difference uh, we're more likely to see what those effects are, uh, but I, I haven't heard that anybody actually has the data, and maybe it's too soon, but uh, I would love to see that because I, at some point we need to put to bed uh, whether or not uh, these changes are helping or hurting. We, we need to know. Thank you, Senator Pickard. Um, and I would agree. I would also be interested in that data. I think our whole committee would. So if you could provide that to the staff when you um, have a chance, we will disseminate it. Um, other questions? And I'm sorry, Senator Pickard, did you have any other questions? OK. Anybody else uh, joining us online who has questions? I don't see anybody uh, jumping in. I know that Senator, I'm not sure if Senator Harris is able to um, turn on her mic yet. But uh, we will come back to her if this we need to. Here. Oh, there she is. Excellent. We have solved all the technological problems of the day. And with that, we will move on to um, our next presenter, Ms. 
Angela Darcy. She's the executive director of the Department of Pretrial Services with the Administrative Office of the Courts in Kentucky. She works on pretrial release issues in another state, uh, being Kentucky, and will have some awesome information for us about how they make their bail process function, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Chairman, and thank you, uh, members of the committee, for having me here today. I'm honored to present, uh, a little nervous, so uh, I'm, I'm not a pro at this quite yet. This is about my, this is my first year in pretrial services and before I was in uh, the Department of uh, Legal Services, so I'm not used to presenting in public, but I think I can get there. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen and we can get started. So really what I'm gonna talk about today is how, um, Kentucky implements Riverside. Uh, can everybody see my screen? I'm hoping. Great. Yes, we can. Uh, so Kentucky is a little bit unique uh, with how we implement Riverside. We are a, uh, a unified court system. We don't have bail bondsmen in Kentucky and our Department of Pretrial Services is statewide. So it's under the administrative office of the courts and uh, in 1976, we became a unified court system. In that same year, uh, we were uh, also created the Administrative Office of the Courts. So let me go to the next slide. Uh, so this just uh, basically overviews on uh, part of the uh, Bail Bond Reform Act was uh, the abolishing of bail bondsmen in the uh, Commonwealth of Kentucky. So basically then pretrial services was formed, stepped in, and we are the ones that help the judge make a determination. And in some cases, we are also allowed to make the determination ourselves through the administrative release uh, program that we have. So this is our mission statement and it's to make the assist the court in making informed pretrial release decisions to effectively supervise defendants in order to support safe communities and to ensure that defendants meet court obligations while maintaining the constitutional presumption of innocence and the right to reasonable bail. Uh, we have six essential principles of pretrial justice. As you can see, it's the presumption of innocence, the right to counsel, the right against self-incrimination, the right to due process, equal protection under the law, and the right to a bail that is not excessive. So I will go over kind of our structure really quickly. We have 220 plus employees with the Department of Pretrial Services. We provide 24 seven support to 14 regions. So that means that we have a second shift and a third shift that are uh, basically working with the jails to, uh, so when somebody is booked, we, work with the jails to intake that defendant to assess their, uh, their risk level. And then if necessary, we call the judge. So this is just a little bit of an overview of our numbers. We have really good data in the Commonwealth of Kentucky with the uh, administrative office of the courts. So uh, we are pretty proud of our data. And so this is just a little snapshot of our data and we have 167,705 arrests in 2019. In 2020, we had 127,652. In 2021, we had 136,414. And so far for uh, this year, we have 46,950. That puts us uh, on track to being about 140,000 arrests. We have gone down substantially, as you can tell, between 2019 and 2020, and that is particularly due to COVID. A lot of our, uh, our officers weren't making arrests, and we were trying to get them out as quickly as possible uh, during COVID. So we did see a substantial reduction in the amount of arrests. Uh, we're going a little bit, jumping a little bit back up this year, but not entirely. So... Uh, that is uh, worth pointing out. So let me just do a really brief uh, overview of Riverside. So Riverside is uh, 
is definitely worth noting because Riverside is, is many people get confused with Riverside and arraignments and initial presentation. So Riverside is solely about the probable cause determination of when somebody is arrested without a warrant, then there has to be a probable cause determination. And Riverside basically said that the probable cause determination has to be done within 48 hours of arrest. So Gerstein v. Pugh was the precursor to Riverside. In Gerstein, the Supreme Court held that the, prompt, the Fourth Amendment required a prompt judicial determination of probable cause when a defendant was arrested without warrant. So what that really said was, uh, and, and that was a really interesting case because in Florida at the time, uh, indictments were only required for capital cases. Any other case could proceed by information. So all other crimes charged by information didn't necessarily require a probable cause determination at that time. So defendants were being held for quite a substantial period of time without a probable cause determination. And so when you're looking at a citation and you, you see on the citation that there's no, maybe no facts of the case or that there's there's nothing on that, that tells you that there's actually a crime committed, that, that's really key here. Was there probable cause to make the arrest? And so that had to be uh, determined by Gerstein. So Gerstein basically held that uh, that they had to do it promptly. So at the time in Florida with the indictments that were only required for capital cases, they had to be done promptly, um, not the capital cases, but the information ones. So arrest warrants were issued the only possible method was to obtain a, a judicial determination was a special statute, which allowed a preliminary hearing within 30 days. So defendants sued and that's where we are today. That's the main takeaway from Gerstein. So really how Kentucky has, uh, uh, I guess, interpreted Gerstein is, is how you'll see shortly. So the main takeaways from Gerstein is the probable cause determination uh, must be made by a judicial officer without, it doesn't have to be with an adversarial hearing. It can just be looking, hearing about the uh, citation, determining if there's probable cause enough to make an arrest. And if you think about it, it really makes sense because a probable cause determination is necessary with a search warrant, right? Or, or with, a, uh, with a warrant or without a, with a warrant, uh, there's already a probable cause determination. So there really isn't a high standard there. It's not a high bar to obtain. So, and because of its non-limited or because of its limited function, it can be non-adversarial. So the probable cause determination is not a critical stage in the prosecution that would require appointed counsel. So let me kind of go ahead and uh, get to the next point because that's really key is that what is considered prompt and prompt of course in Riverside was 48 hours within arrest. So I am going to tell you and I'll skip to the next part because I think really what's key here and, and what Nevada probably really needs to know is how we deal with that probable cause determination. So this is our initial presentation, uh, RCR. And our initial presentation, as you can see, is that an officer making an arrest under a warrant shall be taken before a judge without unnecessary delay. And then any person making an arrest without a warrant shall take a arrested person without unnecessary delay. So they're both the same. However, we have kind of done, uh, we veered away from that RCR and that RCR is a little bit outdated and we don't really follow it as much as we should anymore. Uh, it's interesting to note that this year we are, we are potentially revamping this rule. We are currently, uh, we have a court notification committee and this is something that we are working on taking a look at to make it kind of uh, our, our initial, how we do it with pretrial. So with pretrial, this is how we work. So within 24 hours of the defendant's incarceration, 
we must provide the judge or trial commissioner with information to assist the determination of pretrial release. So pretrial services takes that defendant within 24 hours and we help the judge either determine probable cause or we release the defendant. So let me get to that next point. So this is within 24 hours of booking. So when the defendant is intaked into our system, we take the citation, we enter it into our case management system called PRIM. We send it to the queue for application of risk assessment and to be interviewed. If they are AR eligible, and what AR eligible is, is administrative release eligible. And I will go into a little bit more detail about that. So if they are eligible, then we'll automatically release them. So there will be no probable cause determination made by the judge because they're released immediately. If they are not eligible for AR, then they are presented to the judge. At that time, they are either released, they're released to monitor condition release, which is our supervision program, or they're unable to post. So we evaluate the defendants using both a combination of orders by the Kentucky Supreme Court and an actuarial based risk assessment to determine if they are eligible for administrative release or if they need to be presented to a judge for judge review. So we use the booking time versus the arrest time, but we still do it within 24 hours. So that pretrial services specialist slash officer will actually get to the defendant within the 24 hours, take the citation, they'll call the judge, they'll read the citation to the judge if they're not administrative re administratively released, and the judge will then assess the defendant, they'll take the risk score into, into uh, consideration. They'll, sometimes we will read them the court record, we'll read them the citation. The judge then makes a probable cause determination at that time. And they're either released on bond or ROR and at that, or they're released on a, a financial bond or an unsecured bond, which is the, uh, we have the unsecured and the financial release. So that is how we operate within Kentucky. But one of the things I really would like to talk about is the administrative release as well, because that has been key for us in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And I believe Senator Picard, uh, you know, mentioned all the defendants, uh, not being arrested or cited. So these are actually arrested, but they're low level, uh, low to moderate level uh, risk level defendants. And we have a, an actual risk assessment that we apply and it is an evidence-based tool that we use. So we take that evidence-based tool, we look at the defendant's criminal history, we apply it to the defendant, and then we have a list of charges that we look at to see if the defendant can be released. If the defendant qualifies for release, then the pretrial service specialist by way of the Supreme Court order is actually allowed to release the defendant. So previous to the AR, we had a uniform schedule of bail. So all defendants prior to AR were allowed to be released. If they were charged with nonviolent crimes, they could look at the uniform schedule of bail. And let's say you had a public intoxication in Kentucky, which is, is basically like the, it's not alcohol intoxication, it's, it's drug intoxication. So if they had a public intoxication charge, they could look at the uniform schedule of bail, see that they could post $50, and then they would be released on the uniform schedule of bail. The problem became with our uniform schedule of bail is indigent defendants, many times couldn't even post the $50. So the Supreme Court came up with a pilot project called the administrative release schedule. And the administrative release schedule was piloted in a few counties in the beginning. It did very well. And in 2017, on January 1st, 2017, it became mandatory. So pretrial officers must determine defendant's eligibility for release. If ineligible, then the judge is contacted for the, uh, for the bail decision. And at that time, the judge also makes the probable cause determination. So 
we, the release, no probable cause determination is made. If we don't release, then we have to call the court and then a probable cause determination is made at that time. All right, let me go to the next slide. The next slide is actually just showing our uh, administrative release. And I think it's pretty interesting. And it's really, it's done very well in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. We have released a substantial uh, number of defendants through our administrative release program. It expedites them within about two hours of their arrest, sometimes earlier. We get to the defendants, we have them processed, we have them out of jail. We give them a court date to report back whatever the, uh, the court schedule is to come back to court. And then they are, uh, and then they report back to court. Our administrative release is for nonviolent, low level misdemeanors and felonies. And this is kind of the, the rules around it. This is actually uh, on our uh, Supreme Court, we have the administrative orders. This can actually be found. I'll also be happy to send anybody a copy that would like to see it. So here's what we do when AR is not an option. If the defendant does not meet one or more of the AR criteria, a judge must be called to review the charges and set a bond. The call must be within 24 hours of the time of being booked into the jail. And we provide the judge with the following items of, as I have described before. We give them the citation. They can review the charges, the narrative and any testing listed, the pretrial report. So we have a risk assessment and the risk assessment has what their risk score is. And I'll show that to you in just a second. Uh, the history from CourtNet. So the judge also has the ability to get their entire criminal history. And that's something that we have enabled online with our pretrial history uh, report is the judge can also, will also read the history to the judge if he, if he or she so uh, needs. And then if they have any NCIC record, we also tell the judge what the NCIC record is. It's not something that we provide to them through our website because of our NCIC rules, but we do tell them if they have any out of, uh, out of state records. So this is our release decision. As you can see, this one particular defendant was released pursuant to the Supreme Court order. This also uh, takes some of the weight off of the judges because we administratively release them. So it's, it's showing to the public, if anybody were to ever see the conditions of the release or the, the judicial decision, it shows that it wasn't a judicial decision. It was actually per the Supreme Court order. It also has their bond conditions listed on there. Under the AR order, they're just not, they're ordered not to have any new offenses or arrests. And I believe under our current Supreme Court order, they just can't have contact with the victim. So with administrative release, this is defendants that are extremely low level. We believe that they will come back to court. We believe that they will not reoffend. And that's the two things that our risk assessment looks at. Will they reoffend? And will they come back to court? So that's something that we, we have an actuarial tool. We grade them. We publish the, we, we have their scores, we give that to the judge, and then we either are allowed to make the decision per the Supreme Court order, or if they're moderate to high, or if the charge is inel ineligible, then we'll send them to the judge. And this is actually uh, what the jail sends back to pretrial is confirmation that the defendant was released. At the very bottom there, you can see name of judge, pretrial officer. If the judge didn't release, then our pretrial officer will be the one that's listed on that. And then we also have a section there for administrative release. So that is it. Another thing that we've done in Kentucky, and I'm sure you guys, uh, judges and, and courts in Nevada has, have also had to do the same. But one of the things that we've had to really step up is our video arraignment. So that's another thing that uh, I'd like to mention as well, is that we have stepped up and, and done all arraignments in the Commonwealth of Kentucky with the exception of maybe a couple jurisdictions by video. 
And that is another way where we uh, comply with the RCR 3.02 is because first we're making the probable cause determination, but within a couple days, the defendant is arraigned with the judge. At that time, they're appointed counsel, they're read their charges, they're read their rights, and we are implementing, we have implemented that through video. And one of the great things that we've been able to do as well is we've been able to utilize ARPA funds for our video arraignment. So, the Kentucky legislator has granted us a significant amount of money to rule that out in between between our jails and our uh, in our court system. One of the things that we have seen in all transparency that we have seen some issues with is the out of custody defendants. So when we have a failure to appear and we have a or out of county, we have a defendant that's in another county. We are having some issues with getting the defendant transported to the other county. The jails are, 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 are all kind of backlogged right now. And with COVID, they're having difficulties. Uh, our sheriff's uh, deputies are actually the ones that go and pick up the defendants at the jails and not the jails. So the issue has become that some defendants who have already have charges but have uh, failure to appears have not been transported as quickly. So that's another thing that we're working on with the court notification committee is how do we effectively get them to court sooner? And one of our solutions has been with video arraignment. So at least with a video arraignment and with our hearing, uh, our video hearing system, because it technically wouldn't be an arraignment, they've already been arraigned, they just failed to appear. Or it could also be that they they were not arraigned and failed to appear for their arraignment. So we've tried to implement that statewide and it's worked really well. And that's something that we're currently in the process of designing and rolling out statewide. Our jailers now have funding as well to implement this program. So rather than having to go all the way to the other side of, of uh, Kentucky, they can actually appear by video the judge can see them. The judge can say, hey, I'm going to change your bond to an ROR or an unsecured, set them a new court date, the defendant is released, or the judge can at least put eyes on them. The defendant can see the judge, know that they have an attorney appointed, that they're going to be brought to court uh, or brought back to their original county within two or three days, and uh, there's a little bit more uh I guess, security, a feeling of security for the defendant, because one of the issues that we've seen uh, is that defendants don't really know. So they may be held in Jefferson County, but they'll have a Pike County charge. And that's about a four hour uh, time frame drive wise. So they'll be held in Jefferson County, won't know when they're going back to Pike County. So with our video arraignment system and our, our video hearing system, we can actually get to them quicker. The judge will tell them when they should be expected to be transported back to Pike County. And, uh, and at least the defendant knows. They've seen a judge, they know what their bond is, they know that they have an attorney, and they know approximately when they'll be transported back to Pike County. So that's something that we're working on. Uh, there's always, as you go along, uh, you know, and especially during COVID, this has become more and more of an issue. So we've, we've kind of, we've tried to, uh, we've created a committee and on that committee, we have defense attorneys, prosecutors, jailers, sheriffs, and judges to talk about this issue and how we can kind of expedite uh, these out of custody defendants. So that's another thing that we're looking at. And I'm gonna go back to 302 really quick and just show you that um, that's something that we're addressing with that rule and also with our arraignment rule because it doesn't really speak to an out of, uh, an out of uh, custody or an out of county defendant. So we're going to try and shore this up and add another rule that does address perhaps out of county defendants. So this is only in the initial appearance. In many of in 
a few of our jurisdictions. So I believe in Jefferson County and in Fayette County and some of our bigger jurisdictions, we actually do the initial appearance within 48 hours because they're bigger counties. They have court every day. In Jefferson County, they literally have court seven days a week for arraignments. So we actually do the 48 hour determination pretty quickly with that. And so we combine those typically. Uh, a lot of times the judges will not ask us to read the citation to them because they know that they're gonna be coming up tomorrow for arraignment. So we've combined uh, the probable cause determination and the arraignment into one proceeding in our bigger counties. And I think that that pretty much summarizes it. I hope that uh, I've uh, expressed it clearly. And uh, if anybody has any questions, then. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am sure that we have a number of questions from um, the, the committee members. Any up in Carson City? Okay, we'll come back to Carson City. Uh, let's go down to Las Vegas first. Um, is there anybody in Las Vegas who wants to ask a question? All right, go ahead. That looks like Assembly Member Summers Armstrong. Thank you so much, Chair Scheibel, and thank you, ma'am, for the very thorough uh, explanation. I was reviewing the um, attachment last night and found it quite fascinating. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, I know that Kentucky, uh, Kentucky is a large, you have a lot of rural um, communities. Um, how has your transition uh, to this been, um, and, and specifically, uh, I would love to know how, what the reaction was to no bail bondsmen. Um, I would love to know, you said you had 200 and some odd uh, employees in the uh, administrative office of the court. I'd love to know what your budget is yearly. And um, the last question I have is, I have two more. Software, if, is, is it a, a proprietary and the last would be your video system. Are you using something proprietary or are you using something already um, in use? Um, your costs for that. Um, and I just love to know how this is going for you. Thank you. Sure. So I think probably in 1976, it was probably pretty. Uh, I'm Angela Darcy. Again, I'm forgot to put my name on the record. Uh, in 1976, I think it was probably pretty controversial. We've been doing it for so long now that it had, has just become the norm and the way we do things. Uh, I think that the main uh, issue that we've probably had more than not, but I think that judges have finally uh, started to uh, be okay with the administrative release order. I think in the beginning there was some uh, hesitation for the judges to implement that because it was actually a pretrial uh, service specialist that was releasing uh, these defendants uh, versus the judge. As far as our budget, the administrative office of the courts uh, is the judicial branch. So we have a uh, a different budget than pretrial services does. Uh, I can certainly give, give you our final figure and get that back to you on our pretrial services budget, just so you have an idea. Uh, let me see if I can remember all your questions. Your next question was, our software, is it proprietary? It is created by us, it's a case management system. It is something that we hope to update in the next few years, it is, uh, We've been using it, I think, since 2007 or 2008, so we are in need of an update. Uh, it is a, it's not a web-based program, so it's just a, uh, you know, just a, a regular, uh, a regular program that all our pretrial services specialists use. And it basically, the the screen that you saw in a, uh, with the release decision, it basically populates. So that screen is populated by our system 
and it uploads to the pretrial release decision. And that's something, uh, so our software is proprietary, but we are looking at other options in the near future. And we do hope to, uh, we do hope to update that. As far as our video arraignment system, we use JAVS right now for the recording uh, of our, of our uh, hearings. It is not proprietary. And we also are uh, trying out and uh, a Zoom platform as well. So we are piloting in a couple different regions the, the Zoom platform. JAVS is our recording software, which works in the courtroom. And then that communicates with the defendants in the jail via Zoom. Did that answer all of your questions, Senator? Ooh, no promotion. This is Chandra Summers Armstrong, Assembly District 6. Uh, <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, I, I think it does. I, I think I'm just so amazed um, that you all um, were able to figure this out. Um, our issue is is definitely our rural um, counties are, are, are really struggling with this. Um, and we really want to make sure that we are sensitive to that and f try and find solutions. And so I think that the things that you are um, mentioning work well. I will ask one more thing. You said earlier that you are super excited about the data that you all have collected. Um, and do you have a response to uh, the question that was raised by uh, Senator Pickard earlier about have you seen this increase in in um, crime because you are using this administrative process as opposed to holding folks in jail pretrial? So I don't believe we've seen an increase in crime because we've we've uh, done administrative release. Uh, I certainly uh, will be happy to uh, get some numbers for you. We we have a lot of. Uh, uh, numbers on our administrative release program because we've we want to make sure that we get it right, especially with our judges. So I will be happy to uh, supplement uh, and and get you some data on our administrative release process. Just so you know, we do have we always have FTAs and we always will have new criminal activity. That's just a risk that you take, but. Our administrative release works so well because it helps defendants, and and it's not as it's not a large of, of a number that you would think. It's mainly used for misdemeanors and some Class D felonies. So these are non-violent. So assault wouldn't be eligible. DUI second and thirds are not eligible. So they're just they are really low level. And it was similar to our uniform schedule of bail. So anything that was on the uniform schedule of bail, I believe was also on our administrative release program. What we wanted to do was just to have equity and make sure that our defendants that couldn't afford $50, because we have a lot of rural programs in Kentucky as well, or a lot of rural counties. And what we were seeing in those rural counties is that defendants couldn't post $50 or $35 or $25. So it the poor were being held in jail and the people that could post it were getting out immediately. So that's kind of why the administrative release program was created to be fair to, uh, to all our uh, citizens in the Commonwealth. Thank you. I think there was one other question Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong asked, which was um, what the response has been like to not having bail bonds or not having bail bonds officers in Kentucky. And I would be interested to hear how that came to be and how it's gone. So I think that the history of not having bail bonds, I mean, it, it was probably pretty contentious in the beginning. And uh, I, I can't remember the exact history. It's, it's really interesting story, I believe on how it came to be, but I can't remember the exact story. Uh, you know, there's always the urban legend that, you know, a, a judge was 
you know, a bail bondsman. And, you know, so there, there's a, there's a ton of, uh, there's a ton of history out there and, and I'll be happy to send you the article, uh, uh, once we, uh, uh, I, we have tons of articles and so I'll be happy to send you the article, but I, the general assembly made a decision, uh, not to use bail bondsmen and it was, and it's still really controversial. So we are really still, uh, we're at, we, we do get a lot of attacks from bail bondsmen. They don't like our program. Uh, they, they feel like it doesn't work. We, we feel like it works really well and that we are being fair. We, we do use the risk assessment tool, I think is, is one of the keys to why it works so well is because we can kind of grade what risk level the defendant is going to be. And if they're high, then the judge sets, you know, a, a bond that's commensurate to the risk level and the charges, and the defendant is uh, either not released or has to post a high financial bond. So, and since we don't have bail bondsmen, that is uh, probably one of the downsides. Maybe is that the defendant can't. Uh, there is no ten percent there. It's it's full cash or or they're not released. We do have various levels of financial release. So we have a surety bond where somebody can sign uh, a defendant out and put their name up on the line. We also have a 10%, we have a partially secure bond, and then we have the full cash bond. And then we also have a property bond as well. So we, we have a multitude of different types of bond where the defendant is released. If the defendant, and it's also worth noting that if, if the defendant isn't released within 24 hours, then we call the judge again within 24 hours and just let them know that the defendant has been unable to post bail. And do they wanna look at the charges again? Do they wanna look at the, you know, the defendant's risk level? And, and we'll kind of go through that review again with them, so. Thank you. Um, I have some more questions, but I usually save mine for the end, um, which I will do this time. I'll go back down to our colleagues in Las Vegas and see who has questions. It looks like um, Vice Chair Wynn has a question. a question. No, I think we're good down here, actually. Okay. Uh, then we will go to our colleagues on the internet, and I see Senator Pickard has a question. Please go ahead. Thank you, and uh, Assemblywoman uh, Summers Armstrong uh, took a little bit of my win, but uh, I am interested to know uh, how these things have worked because we get uh, the, the differing reports. I'd also be particularly interested in knowing what you use as a, 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 a risk assessment tool. Uh, because there's a lot of them out there uh, created for different purposes by different people. Um, I, 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 not to plug uh, a particular author, but I was reading a book. Um, uh, it, it, it was um, Talking to Strangers uh, by uh, Malcolm Gladwell. And he, he talked about the studies that have been done as to whether or not judges can make a better decision than the risk assessment tool, and they failed utterly. And so I've been really interested in finding out what works and what doesn't in terms of that risk assessment tool. So I wonder if you would share with us uh, the details of that so that we sure. can you know, more uh, uh, compare that to what we're using. So that was it, uh, uh, Chair Scheibel, thank you. Thank so you. our risk assessment tool was created by the Arnold Foundation and we, we've, uh, they, they did a big, study and, and evaluated and and we did a lot of uh in case not case studies but we took the defendant and the arnold tool helped us or the arnold foundation helped us build that tool so and i'll be happy to send you the risk factors that we look at and and how we grade it uh, because it is really interesting now i mean we do have some judges that don't like the risk assessment tool, right, and believe that judicial discretion is key and that they know, you know, as you said, better than the tool. And so it's just one of the factors that the court has to consider. The court doesn't have to base their whole determination on what our risk assessment tool says. It's just they can look at it. They can say, yeah, I don't think that's true. 
And I'm going to say that because of the nature of the offense, because of the uh, his criminal history, uh, I'm going to give him a higher bond. So there's still judicial discretion built in there for our judges. And I think that's really the key. And that's something that we try to, uh, you know, constantly emphasize is that you always have discretion to go against the tool. That is your, as a judge, that absolutely you're, you're right. So, uh, but it, it's built, it, it does, it, there are faults with it. And there's always, you know, there's, I think, five plus or minus 5%, it's accurate. So, so there's always that level where it's not, it's going to miss. And I think what's interesting, uh, you know, because a lot of times what you'll have is somebody that has never committed a crime in their entire life and then has been charged with murder. So they're going to be low on the scale because they don't have any failures to appear and they don't have any new criminal activity. So the judge really has to take our other factors that are in a statute and look at that and then base it on that as well. So what I hear you saying is that the risk assessment tool um, is by and large working well and you're not seeing uh, uh, an increase of even petty crime uh, corresponding to people that aren't being uh, uh, kept in custody. And so generally speaking, uh, uh, give or take a little bit of uh, built-in uh, human error, yeah. um, uh, you're, 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 you feel it's successful. So that's that's really good to hear. We feel it's successful. And, and I will say this, is that we are required by statute to look at that tool every few years to make sure that it is still accurate. And so that is something that we are getting ready to do again, is look at the tool, see if something else could also work as well. So a judge may say, well, I don't think, I, I think your tool's horrible. So then we may take the judge's factors and try and see if we can get an evidence-based tool out of that. And then what we usually do is an independent study. We'll send it to, uh, you know, Harvard. We'll, we'll get somebody to look at the tool and see with both factors there, which one actually is evidence-based and has the, the backing behind it to prove it. And then, you know, in our, in our our existing tool, if that still is accurate. I will say this, what we have realized though during COVID is that as charges get pushed down the road, defendants are more likely not to appear. So that has been one of the things that has been concerning is that six months out. So some of some of these charges were actually pushed out almost a full year. And we were we did have issues. So as as long as if you can get them back to court within a relatively quick time, then our FTA FTA rate has been has been pretty good. If you push it out longer and we have data that shows the longer you push it out, then the less reliable the tool gets because it's now been a year and defendants forget or you know they go off the radar and and they're hard to find uh, that and that's critical information right yeah. because then we have to correlate that data you know that that trend uh, mm -hmm. against the uh, uh, the tool itself to see uh, maybe the FTAs are going down um, for a different reason, maybe right. the, the tool isn't even uh, the the key connection. Anyway, I don't want to take too much time on this, but thank you. It's it's really encouraging to hear that this concept is working because it's new here. Well, it's not new; it's just something we haven't fully adopted uh, in the same way you have. Yeah, and I will say that if we, it would be very difficult. So my understanding that with the Nevada system is that the judges are doing court and you are doing the initial hearing and all of that within 48 hours. And I think that that would also be difficult in the Commonwealth of Kentucky as well. That's why we have implemented our 24 hour rule with pretrial. So that probable, so they're either released or that probable cause determination is made right away. So that has, I, I believe that has been critical to our success, to be honest with you. 
And if you could just put your name on the record again. Uh, Angela Darcy. Thank you. Um, did we have other questions from our members online or did Ms. Widgery want to uh, chime in? Go ahead, Ms. Widgery. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. Oh. Senator Scheibel, Amber Widgery, NCSL. I was just taking notes on some of those questions and wanted to sort of weigh in from a broader perspective outside of Kentucky. Kentucky, you know, prohibited the use of commercial bill bondsmen you know, a long time ago. I just wanted to highlight that there are also a total of five states that have eliminated uh, commercial bail bondsmen legally. Um, the most recent to do so is Massachusetts in 2017. Um, you know, Illinois, Oregon, and Wisconsin were, you know, many years before that, but Massachusetts being the most recent to um, eliminate the use of commercial bail bondsmen in statute specifically, it actually didn't get a lot of attention and wasn't very controversial because a lot of their system had evolved so much over time, whether through, you know, authorizing 10% bonds or reducing reliance on money in general, um, that bondsmen really weren't working in the state by the time the legal elimination came through. And so there was a statutory prohibition on fiscally benefiting from posting a bond. So somebody else can still post your bond. You just can't fiscally benefit and make a profit off of posting that bond in Massachusetts. And I would say that largely went sort of unnoticed overall because they were already just functionally not using commercial bond industry in that state. And then we also have a couple examples of states. New Jersey is usually the example that comes up. Um, commercial bail bondsmen aren't statutorily prohibited from operating within this, that state, but functionally, they're just really not utilized all that often. The same can be said for the Washington DC system as well. So just wanted to highlight, you know, Kentucky, sort of that elimination was a long time ago. Um, some of the more recent history on that front. And then, um, I can talk about the risk assessment piece if that's of interest in terms of what other states are doing too, but I'll stop there, Senator. Thank you. Um, that, that is also helpful. I, I do have a couple of questions and maybe uh, going to Ms. Darcy and getting an understanding first would be really helpful because y you did mention that um, you know, Nevada's system works, and it is Nevada, not Nevada, uh, works a little little different than Kentucky's. And um, so here we have judges who review probable cause, you know, just from a piece of paper. They don't see the defendant in person in order to do that. And then the first, but they can set bail at that time or release them at that time. And it sounds like that part is similar to Kentucky. And then... Um, the part where the individual gets seen within 48 hours, regardless in Nevada. Well, as long as they're still in custody in Nevada, they get seen within 48 hours. But it sounds like in Kentucky, if they're still in custody, they get seen within 24 hours. Or, or did I misunderstand? So they, we talk to the judge within 24 hours. Pre-trial does uh, talks to the judge. The defendant doesn't necessarily, except for our larger jurisdictions, Kentucky doesn't necessarily, the defendants in our rural jurisdictions don't see the judge right away. The arraignment is with, with uh, in that lovely language of without unnecessary delay. So, and I, I think that has been, you know, all, you know, in every state, I think that's, you know, that's up to what unnecessary delay really means. And so we haven't defined that in Kentucky, but they are presented to the judge. So we call the judge, we will tell the judge what their risk assessment score is. We will present the citation to them. And we do that within the 24 hours. The defendant isn't necessarily going to see the judge within 24 hours but the judge does know that the defendant has been arrested and that there is a charge out there and then they are set on the docket for arraignment. So, and, and in our rural counties, that is something that, you know, with the court notification process committee, that's something that we're looking at as well, because do we need to expedite those as well and get those done quicker? Because in so, some of our smaller communities, probably much like Nevada, you know, we only have court maybe once a week. And so, you know, the defendant is also, even though his bail has been determined by the judge and the probable cause determination has been made, 
they still haven't necessarily talked to their counsel yet. They haven't been read their rights. They haven't been arraigned. So that is something that we are currently working on and hoping that we can tweak that a little bit more. Uh, and much like, uh, am I going to say Nevada, Nevada? Did I say it right? Nevada. 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 Okay. It's, it's like, it's like Louisville. Everybody says Louisville and it's Louisville. So exactly. uh, Nevada is, uh, yeah, we, we still have things to work on. And, and I think that's any time that you have uh, defendants with, you know, substantial due process rights and, and just to make sure that you're conforming with the Constitution, uh, it's important to get that right. And, and that's something that Kentucky is constantly uh, pushing to get right. So we're by no means perfect. So I do not want to give any appearance that we're perfect. We still have our issues here in, in, in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. But I think that we do a really good job of getting the defendants before the judge so a bail can be set. Thank you. That That's a very helpful. So they, they do get bail set within 24 hours. And then what you're saying is if, um, you know, bail is set at an amount that they can't afford, then that's it's that period of time from the time bail is set to the time they go in front of a judge that could be longer than 24 or 40 hours in the more populous jurisdictions. Yeah. It's probably only 24 hours, but in a more rural jurisdiction where they only meet once a week, if you're arrested on Wednesday and they meet on Tuesday, it could be next Tuesday before you're seen by the judge. And so if you're seen by the judge the next Tuesday, I assume that is when um, counsel would be appointed if you can't afford it. And then that counsel could readdress their custody status, and that would also be their arraignment. I am I correct? That would be yes. their arraignment time. Yes. Okay. Something else that I think would be helpful for us to understand, because it's different <laughs> in different states, is when somebody is arraigned, um, what is the next procedural step in a criminal case? Do you have another probable cause determination that has to be made before um, it's set for trial or sent to a higher court, or what? What's your process? So within Kentucky, we have misdemeanors and felonies. And so some of our misdemeanors are, all of our misdemeanors are, the next step would be a pretrial conference. With felonies, the next step is if they're arrested and it's not by indictment and it's just, so let's say an officer charges the defendant and there's an so there's what we call an F case. And the F case is, is where it starts. And it basically starts in misdemeanor court, in our district courts. And so they have to have a hearing within 10 days of the defendant being arraigned. So that's the next step for felonies. With misdemeanors, they're just set for a pretrial conference. But with felonies, if they start in district court, which is our misdemeanor court, then they have to have a preliminary hearing within 10 days. And that's when they have basically a second probable cause determination at that time. And that sounds a lot like Nevada's probable cause hearing, which is within 15 days of an arraignment. And one of the unique things about Nevada's probable cause hearings are that we have all the same rules of evidence that apply at the jury trial, apply to our probable cause preliminary hearings. Um, do you know if Kentucky is the same or if they have different rules of evidence for their preliminary hearing? So I used to be a public defender, so I know this pretty well. And the standards are a lot different. So probable cause determinations do not have the same standards. The preliminary hearing can use uh, hearsay. There doesn't have to be uh, an eyewitness. It, it's not the same standard as the, uh, as the trial. Okay. So. so, so that is very different from Nevada's system. And yes. so, yeah, so, th and this is more of a comment than a question just to help some folks who um, might not be familiar to understand the difference between in Kentucky, if you're getting ready to go, if you've already been arraigned and you're getting ready to go to your probable cause hearing in 10 days, um, you can expect that the prosecutor there can present hearsay. They probably bring in an officer who explains to the court what they saw when they got there, who told them what, when they got there. Um, and so 
as you can imagine, that takes a certain amount of time for all of the parties to get ready for that kind of hearing. Here in Nevada, our standard um, is the standard of proof isn't higher, but the type of evidence that you need is more stringent. It follows the rules of a felony uh, jury trial. So instead of just bringing in an officer who can describe what happened on the scene, who he or she talked to here in Nevada, we have to bring in the victim or an eyewitness or um, the owner of the property, things like that. Um, so I'm just mentioning this so that people can kind of, you know, get get a picture for the difference between going from, you know, 10 days in Kentucky to get an officer on the stand versus in Nevada going 15 days to get a victim and an eyewitness and an officer all on the stand. And also the time that it takes a court to conduct a preliminary hearing. Um, because I've, I've also practiced in jurisdictions that have the, you know, that allow hearsay at the preliminary hearing level and those preliminary hearings go much faster. Um, so I think that is really helpful for us um, to understand. And um, I just wanted to go back to a, cu a couple of other things. Um, and one of them is how the use or how having a unified court system makes this easier, harder, different, doesn't matter. So, and, and I think Kentucky will say that the unified court system makes the process a lot simpler because we all play by the same rules and we are all uh, under uh, the authority of the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court establishes our rules and procedures. And so you may see a little variation jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but for the most part, the procedure remains the same. And so I think that that makes it, so if I was an attorney practicing in Pikeville, Kentucky, although it may be a little bit different because it's more rural county than Jefferson, essentially it's still the same. All the rules of procedure still apply. Uh, we're still gonna have that hearing within 10 days. And it just, it's, it kind of simplifies it. Now they may have local procedures that they, that they follow and all our local rules and our local procedures have to go through the Supreme Court. So they may do things a little bit differently, but typically you know ahead of time as an attorney practicing what those procedures look like, like when they do motion hour, when they have their arraignment dockets, because a lot of times that is on um, the internet with our local rules. And uh, you know the Chief Justice and the Supreme Court have approved those local rules. So I, I think it I think it helps. There's always going to be a little bit of difference because that's just the way things are. But for the most part, we have uniform procedures. We know what to expect, and there may be a little nuance here and there. But we believe that the unified court system has worked really well for Kentucky. Thank you. That um, is also helpful. And I know that we've already talked about funding. I was just hoping that you could give us a, a quick insight into the funding structure in Kentucky, whether you guys uh, utilize fees from people who are being charged with crimes, whether it is a, a state fund expenditure, local dollars. Um, how do you do that? So, and, and if I can add to that as well, uh, Senator, is that uh, with the unified court system, just to, on the other point, is that that also helps give us a really good data. Uh, our, our data is, is, since it's all unified, we actually have a research and stats department within the administrative office of the courts, and they can pull all our data. So, that's one of the other benefits of being a unified court system. As far as how we're funded, so we are funded by the legislators, but then we also have some, and, and I really can't speak to this because I'm not in budget, uh, and I can certainly get them to uh, to, to supplement that if, uh, if you would like. But the way we work is that the Kentucky legislators uh, give us a budget every year. We have an annual budget, much like the executive branch. So the Kentucky legislators, since we are a unified court system, the judicial branch has a budget and some of it is designated for salaries. Some of it is designated for other. And a lot of our, um, a lot of our budget is 
can be line itemed by the Kentucky legislator with a certain respect, since we're a separate branch of government, obviously there is also, you know, a different level of control as well. But we have, we do supplement our salaries with court costs, uh, fees. We also have uh, programs that uh, may bring in and may fund like an additional position. For example, in the past, we've had uh, diversion positions with Kentucky pretrial and uh, the fees that come from those diversions may actually fund that position. So we have some internal funding. We also have our records department that charges for a court record for a private agency. And they, uh, that is a, an additional, I think, uh, I think some of that money goes towards into the general fund and the general fund is the state fund. And then I believe some of that is allowed by the legislators to come back to uh, the administrative office of the courts. So the judicial branch has a budget. Uh, AOC is within the judicial branch. So we have a designated budget as well. And it is actually public record. I believe this year our budget was House Bill 244. And so if you want to see our our overall costs and how much we were allocated, then you can look at House Bill 244 and that uh, that will line out how much we get every year. You answered that question very well. <laughs> you sound like you <laughs> could work in the budget office and they would be lucky to have you. So. I could not. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. If you're listening out there, don't don't take her because um, it's I'm probably getting a text message right now telling me. <laughs> <laughs> no, they need you where you are because you are so knowledgeable and obviously doing such great work to, um, you know, bring Kentucky's court systems into compliance with your constitution. And, um, you know, you you mentioned how important it is that when we pass laws, when we have a constitution that gives people accused of crime certain rights, that we have to have to follow it um, and ensure that everybody is um, ha has equal access to justice. So we really appreciate that. Um, you did inspire in me just two more questions. Well, one more question for you and one more question for Ms. Widgery. And my question for you is um, if you could say just kind of generally, if I am like the loved one of somebody who has been arrested, is any or most of this information also updated online as somebody goes through the process? Um, or would you really have to be connected to the court system to know where somebody is in that process? So you would have to be connected to the court system in the sense of, I think that anybody can look up I think it is public. Our, so we have, our, our court records aren't necessarily, our electronic court rec records aren't public, uh, like, cause they're not court records. That's just our case management system. So, but the public can look on there and actually see when a defendant, if the case is currently pending, they can actually look on there and see when the defendant's next court date is. I'll have to look and see. I'm not sure if it tells you what the bail is, but a lot of times we field those questions as well. So they'll call pretrial services and say, hey, or we have a we have an email address and, and we get, you know, a substantial amount of emails on a daily basis of, hey, my loved one's in jail, can you tell me what the process is? And we get back to them pretty quickly on that and let them know, you know, here's here's the bond, here's, you know, here's what the process is. And, and we try to do as much as we can to explain it to them. Thank you. And I think that is fantastic. I could probably keep asking questions for um, the rest of the meeting. So I am going to restrain myself. Um, and I think some members had some questions. But before I forget, Ms. Widgery, um, we were hoping that we could get um, another presentation like this. Uh, we're very interested in um, other states that have those rural jurisdictions. And um, I think that we're facing the exact same problems Kentucky is facing with jurisdictions where court only meets once a week. And how do you get somebody, um, even if you get the judge to review the document, you get bail set, how do you get somebody in front of a judge um, when court doesn't meet for three or five or six more days? And so if you have any jurisdictions you know of that have approach that problem, have ideas, 
maybe they even solved the problem. Um, we would love to hear from them. So maybe it's... Can I... Sorry, please. Can I say one more thing about that? Please. Is that, that is also something that we have addressed with our video arraignment system. We are actually getting them in front of the court a lot quicker than what we had previously with our video arraignment system. So, and it hasn't... Uh, it's actually been really cost effective for the courts and the legislators because it there's so, at least eyes on the defendant with our video arraignment system. And so I just wanted to, to mention that that's something that we're using as well. Oops. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. And so with the video system, um, is it generally the judge who would who presides over the case who sees them or do the judges rotate and take turns or so? Are you saying that judges who work in courthouses where they only hold court, say, every Tuesday, will hop on a video conference and do an arraignment on a Thursday? So our courts have been more willing to do video arraignments because they're allowed. So our courts, uh, and, and it's much like any probably any other jurisdiction, the judge may cover three or four different counties. And so he has a circuit. So one of the issues has been is that he couldn't necessarily cover, you know, I'm going to go back to Pikeville because that's where I practice law. He might not be able to, he might not be able to get to Pikeville, Kentucky because he's in Floyd County. So he may not be able to do it in person, but he can certainly do a video arraignment. So I believe that judges have been implementing the video arraignment system to get these defendants brought before them quicker. So I think in certain jurisdictions, the answer is yes. They have been using that as a great tool. And it's particularly with our out of custody, or I keep saying out of custody, I've got that in my head. With our out of county defendants, that has been uh, the key to getting our out of county defendants. So somebody might have not been arraigned, but didn't show up for the charge. And so the judge can actually see that defendant in it. Let's say they went to Jefferson that day and picked up and, and got a bench warrant served on them. So the judge in Pike County could actually video uh, arraign the defendant in Jefferson County and then at least get a uh, counsel appointed, hopefully transition them quicker back to Pikeville. And that's, that's one of the things that we've been studying. We still have issues. There's, you know, we're always going to have issues, but we're, I think we're, we're kind of getting into where we're really using technology to help us, you know, control some of those issues, I think. And um, when you utilize the technology, do you have to bring, do you know, do they have to bring in the full court staff in order to do that? Um, are they able to do arra I think you mentioned they do arraignments from other courtrooms. Will the, you know, the staff in, I think you said it was Floyd, they will run the technology for a defendant who might be in Pikeville and just conduct that arraignment, even though it's not there. Okay. You're, you're not right. in your head. Yeah. Yeah. So our jab system records it. So our main concern is whether it's recorded and on the record. And so our jab system records it. But we are we are working on a uniform. So the Kentucky legislator has given given us a substantial amount of money as well as the jails to coordinate with us to to make that happen. So yes, we can we have the same software. So we can use in Pikeville, Kentucky, we could use we have the same recording software that will be able to be used in the jail in Jefferson County. So it, it really is coming from our end. And, and as long as we can zoom in with the defendant, we can record it. That, that sounds like a huge, um, a huge piece of the puzzle. So thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and I think that my colleague here in Carson City has, okay. Is there anybody down in Las Vegas who has any more questions? Is that assembly member? I think we are good, Chair. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair Wynn. Then we will go to assembly member uh, O'Neill up here. Thank you, Chair. And like you, I'm, this has been a very interesting presentation, and I probably could spend 
a good part of the day asking more and more questions, but I'll try to uh, confine to just a few general ones. Does Kentucky, have you heard of Marcy's Law? Mm -hmm. Does this program yeah. of notification to the victim, et cetera, deal, does it comply with Marcy's Law? So in Kentucky, we used to have, uh, and, and we have VineLink in Kentucky where it, it notifies a, uh, the victim if the victim signs up whether the, the defendant has been released from custody. But in Kentucky, uh, Marcy's Law puts the onus on the prosecutors to notify the victim and to keep the victim updated. So it is our prosecutors uh, by statute that are required under Marcy's Law to, uh, to do all that notification. So is the prosecutor aware, I was looking at one of your slides within 24 hours of booking this, this, or that happens. So within the, is the prosecutor notified also that the judge released them on OR or that they were released automatically, they're eligible and released? No. So, and, and that's a really good point is that uh, we haven't had, as far as I know, our Marcy's Law statute is, is really new and it's actually, I believe that uh, it's in the constitution now. So there was a constitutional amendment on Marcy's law. And that's a good point. And the answer is we haven't had any instances yet that we know of where the victim has notified a prosecutor and the prosecutor has asserted the right before during that 24 hour period to notify uh, the victim. So we, as far as I have that I know, uh, we haven't had any of those instances, but certainly under Marcy's law, the victim would absolutely be entitled to uh, have a say in that. Uh, our 24 hour uh, determination is, is kind of like a probable cause. And so that's when the judge reviews to see if it's something you know, that they would have necessarily uh, kept the defendant in custody on anyway. So I don't know, to be honest with you, how that would play in, but I think under Marcy's law, they would have the right. Thank you, and I've got two more if I may. So the defendant is released. Um, does your pretrial services follow up? Can they be released with requirements, uh, i.e. drug, alcohol testing, any monitoring? Does your pretrial re follow up with them and do the monitoring of them, or is that incumbent upon the local sheriff's office? So that's a good question. With our administrative release program, and, and that's something that uh, the administrative release, uh, and just for the record, our admin release program doesn't typically have uh, what you would say as victims, like they, we may have trespassing charges on there. We may have some theft charges, but we don't typically have any, we don't have any violent offenses on our administrative release program. Our administrative release program has no conditions other than not to commit any new offenses and to come back to court and not to have contact. If there's a victim in the case, not to have contact with the victim. That's what our administrative release program does. The other aspect of it is our monitored condition release program. And that is where pretrial supervises them. What we do is we, uh, if the judge puts a condition on them and says pretrial needs to monitor that, if it's drug testing and they are a, an approved provider with, uh, with the administrative office of the courts, then we will monitor their drug testing and make sure that they have complied with the, the court order. And we also have, we, we make them check in with us when it's pretrial supervision. It's kind of a lower level of supervision with our monitor condition release than, than probation and parole. Like our pretrial officers or our service specialists would not go out to a defendant's house, for example. And that's also something else that we're working on as well. Of course, right? You guys are gonna be like, gosh, they're working on everything. But we're trying to get it right. One of the things that we're turning towards in Kentucky is a recovery oriented system of care. And pretrial is also going into that direction as well. So if, for example, 
if a defendant has uh, is on monitor conditioned release and they test positive, then we might be able to link them to a resource for drug testing or not drug testing, for drug treatment. So the court may not uh, revoke them and allow them to go to treatment because we've kind of linked them with that resource. So that's something that we're also trying to, to implement in Kentucky as well. Uh, that is, uh, we've just started the talks about that. Uh, the Kentucky court system has adopted the recovery oriented system of care. So we are in the process of implementing that as well. And it's kind of resource driven. So if we can, and it's not us actually doing the work on it, if we can refer them to a source and the source can get them into treatment, then we will tell the judge that, you know, hey, this treatment center is able to uh, provide services for this defendant do you still want to revoke the bond? And then the judge can make the determination that way. We've also got a, a, a few other programs that we're working on in Kentucky. We have a lot of pilots and we're trying to get uh, uh, case managers. We've, we've got a pilot for case managers coming up where we will actually look at, uh, we'll, we'll refer them to a mental health uh, provider or a, uh, they'll do a clinical assessment and then see if, if they can be provided services for drug treatment. So, and we also have something that just popped up recently called Senate Bill 90, 90 that just passed, which is gonna be a pilot in uh, at least 10. And, and that's going to be diverting the charges, certain charges and drug treatment or mental health treatment for the defendant. So that's something that we, we've just, that just got passed this past uh, legislative session. So we're excited about that. Thank you, Chairs. Ms. Darcy talked. That was a long just, way of answering that it, question. <laughs> no, it brings just more questions and it's, yeah, in a very good way. It's interesting. I'd like to hear more about your, your programs and your success and the failures, because I think we learn a lot from our failures at yeah. times more than the success. Absolutely. So yeah. I do appreciate yeah. it. And uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Um, I agree that there there is so much more to, to talk about here, and um, I'm already bugging my staff about coming up with a, another meeting or a forum or a workshop or, or something, and um, I hope that you are interested in traveling to Nevada. We can be, meet up north in Tahoe or down south in Las Vegas, so think about which one you would prefer. <laughs> or we can go I love it. Assembly member, uh, oh, no, so Elko. we can go to Ely or Elko. Yes. <laughs> we ha the peanut gallery agrees that we, they'd like to see you in Elko. So uh, I guess it's been decided. Um, we just need a date. And um, it is, it, it is um, only partially in jest. This has been fascinating, incredibly helpful. And um, it's also kind of, um, I think, reassuring to hear that other states have similar issues, similar questions, um, and that you know Nevada is not alone in trying to undertake this huge project of reforming the way that we treat people pre-trial and trying to get them out of custody but keep the community safe. And so um, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you so much for presenting to us today and answering all of our questions. Thank you, Ms. Widgery, for joining us, for bringing us Ms. Darcy. And um, we just we can't thank you enough for, for taking the time to do these presentations. So um, I think that will close out agenda item number three. Um, we're going to move on. To, we're going to move to agenda item number five because we have some presenters who have some time constraints. Um, and I also know that it is noon and I am hungry. Other people may or may not be hungry, but we're not breaking for lunch yet because we have to get through um, our fantastic presentation from the Fines and Fees Justice Center. You're always welcome to eat snacks at your desk um, while we hear these presentations. And then we will probably break for lunch after that, which is not a way of asking you to hurry or anything. Uh, we do want to give you our full attention, and I'm sure we'll have some questions. So um, please go ahead whenever you are ready.
Thank you, Chair Scheibel. I'm trying to understand what Mr. O'Neill is. Oh, Nick's hat, they would like you to. Oh, yeah, We're gonna get it right. Well, good. Yeah. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel, uh, Judiciary Committee and members, and the members of the peanut gallery. I mean, shout out to the peanut gallery. I am Lisa Mosley, the Nevada State Director for the Fines and Fees Justice Center. And if you don't know, the Fines and Fees Justice Center is a national organization that works to eliminate fees in the criminal legal system and to make fines more proportionate to an individual's ability to pay. Um, I am joined today by our fabulous Deputy State Director Nick Shepak um, here in Carson City. We have some presenters that will be joining us from uh, Grant Sawyer, which is Nate Waugh from the Nevada Homeless Alliance, and Ms. Yvette Williams from the Clark County Black Caucus. And I do hope that our presentation is going to be as, as riveting as Ms. Darcy and Ms. Widgery. Um, I agree, Mr. O'Neill was quite fascinating. And so, um, today, we are here to talk about misdemeanors. And out of respect for the committee and your time, our pre presentation is going to be as concise as possible. And we will be happy to come back and present um, a more in-depth presentation at a later time, if you so desire. The misdemeanor uh, system. We heard, in, even in Ms. Widgery and Ms. Darcy's presentation, that misdemeanors are often referred to as minor. And we call them a misdemeanor system. In actuality, they are a component of a much larger system that includes misdemeanor infractions. This system is made up of courts, is made up of legislators, law enforcement, prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, service providers, and of course, individuals living in communities. With some of these entities uh, directly benefiting from misdemeanor infractions, and some of them even relying on people to committing crimes to keep those systems running. But one of the greatest harms and misconceptions about the misdemeanor systems is that, that is, they are in fact minor, and that they have very little or no impact on communities and individuals who are charged with them in their communities. And nothing could be further from the truth. These misdemeanors cause extensive harm to individuals that are charged with them and convicted, and also their communities, particularly children and families. In her book, um, Punishment Without Crime, Professor Alexandra Natapoff writes that every year across the state, about 13 million individuals are charged with misdemeanor crimes. These are crimes such as seatbelt violations, driving a vehicle with a re expired registration, possessing drug paraphernalia, having an air freshener or something like that dangling from your rearview mirror or disorderly conduct. Misdemeanors make up across the country about 80% of criminal cases. And here in Nevada, they make up nearly 60% of criminal filings. And my colleague Nick will talk about that um, his part of the presentation is just a few minutes. Most of the arrests in the state of Nevada are in fact for misdemeanor convictions, misdemeanor crimes. Most of the arrests are also for misdemeanors. This process traps many individuals, particularly those, as we all know, from low income, working class communities and communities of color, in a cycle that, is, that often includes being arrested, charged, convicted, or accepting a plea or even jailed and placed or placed on some type of supervision where their freedom um, is restricted. The consequences of misdemeanor have long-term effects that can cause harm to individuals for years to come after they have been convicted of a misdemeanor. Through this process, individuals often lose their jobs, their children, their housing, their health, money, and ultimately their freedom. They can be disqualified from receiving social services, and even prevented from getting admission to things like law school or medical school. Misdemeanors criminalize the homeless by making some actions of the unhoused a criminal offense, and Nate from the Homeless Alliance will talk about that in a few minutes. Misdemeanors generate a ton of revenue for municipalities. Some of these municipalities rely on this revenue to run their cities, and with recent events of COVID, we have learned that many times this revenue stream is absolutely unreliable. 
We believe that it's time for our state to take a long, hard look at this system that we call misdemeanors. It's time for us to evaluate whether such a system has proven to be harmful, if it's effective, if it's an effective way to deal with crimes in this state. I am now going to turn this over to our keeper of our data, Mr. Nick Shepak, and he will share um, some data specific to Nevada on misdemeanors. Thank you, uh, Chair Scheibel and committee members. My name is Nick Shepak. I am the State Deputy Director of the Fines and Fees Justice Center here in Nevada. Uh, I'm very happy to be following the presentation from Kentucky because they talked a lot about how they have a unified court system and how great that is for data collection. We do not have a unified court system here in Nevada, and getting data on things such as misdemeanors has been proven very difficult. Uh, that is one reason why one of our suggestions moving forward here will be to work with the Sentencing Commission to gather the data necessary to do a uh, robust analysis and hopefully robust reform of the misdemeanor system here in the state. Um, I will quickly mention the supplemental information that we have uh, get provided the committee. Um, we have, there are some charts that show the total number of misdemeanors in which courts they are filed in. There are also some charts that break it down by population size. Um, we won't be digging into those completely in this presentation uh, because of time, but I worked pretty hard on them, so you all get to look at them. Um, we, I also provided uh, information on what Colorado did. Colorado embarked on a multi-year uh, assessment of their misdemeanor system where they made recommendations line by line uh, with an eye at figuring out ways to either decriminalize, legalize, or move, uh, lower the penalties and of citations that do not have a direct impact on public safety. They also found some misdemeanors that they believe should be moved up to what we would have as a gross misdemeanor or even low-level felonies. Uh, they did this through a comprehensive review. Um, Tracking down all the misdemeanors in the Nevada Revised Statutes is difficult. Thankfully, LCB has embarked on this process and should have a product within the next few months that compile all misdemeanors in the Nevada Revised Statutes. We also must understand that lots of misdemeanors um, are municipal codes created by cities and counties. So I'm going to go through some top line data to help everyone understand the scope of the misdemeanor system in Nevada and uh, who it impacts, and hopefully this will help um, convince us that you know, a robust look at the system is a good move for the state, and then we will provide some other recommendations that we think we can handle this session, um, but we'll get there in a bit. So uh, this is the total misdemeanor filings in Nevada for the last three years. So it was just over 82,000 in 2019, Almost 87,000 in 2020, while felonies dropped and traffic plummeted during the pandemic, we actually saw more misdemeanor cases filed than the previous year. Uh, in 2021, we saw a significant drop down, back down to 72,000. Uh, they make over, up over half of all criminal uh, filings each year. And if you look at just the muni courts and the justice courts, which handle most of uh, our criminal cases, they make up over 60% each time. So this, the misdemeanor system is in fact uh, the biggest chunk of all criminal, the criminal system here in Nevada. Um, when we look at courts with the highest misdemeanor filings, um, this probably isn't a surprise to anyone. Uh, Las Vegas in the justice courts uh, makes up almost three quarters. Uh, it did make up almost three quarters in uh, 2020, and it's over 64% of all misdemeanors filed are in Las Vegas justice in the justice courts. Uh, followed by Reno and Sparks for most years, although Carson City uh, is right there with Sparks hovering around 3.6 to 3% of all misdemeanors filed. When we look at the municipal courts, uh, it's Las Vegas, Reno, Henderson have the highest number of misdemeanors filed. Now, this data, if we only look at this, may suggest that uh, misdemeanors are a problem or are at least a concern in the more metropolitan areas of our state. But one thing that we're doing at the Fines and Fees Justice Center 
uh, is trying to focus more on the rules. We believe strongly that really every entity, from the legislature to organizations such as our own, often focus on Washoe, Clark, and we forget about our girls. So we've been doing, we have started to embark on a rural tour. We have been down to Searchlight, we have been down to Laughlin, and we will continue moving, hopefully, in the south until it gets warm, come up north when it's nice. But we want to talk to as many people in the rural as we can to find out how this, how misdemeanors, traffic, how the courts are impacting the locals there. And when we look at misdemeanors per 1,000 served, so each court each year, the uh, AOC decides, uh, has a count of how many people each court serves in their jurisdiction. And so if we look at that, and then we look at how many misdemeanor cases are filed per individual served, we see that this issue truly is uh, impacting everyone in the state. We have Tahoe, Hawthorne, Virginia City, um, Searchlight makes a list, Laughlin, Good Springs, um, and then when we look at the Muni Courts, it is Fallon, West Windover, Carlin. So what we're hoping that a robust look at misdemeanors does is not only find places where we can remove crimes from the books, we can maybe uh, figure out some better alternatives than criminal punishments, but also what's happening in these rural areas where they're having such a high rate of misdemeanors filed based on their population, and how can we assist those rural communities in addressing those issues? Because if the misdemeanor rates are staying high year over year, and these are small level crimes, they're usually due to poverty, they're often due to substance abuse issues, mental health issues, and by taking a robust look at this system and better understanding what's happening in our rural communities as well as in our uh, big metropolitan areas where the bulk of the misdemeanors are filed, we can come up with solutions to address some of these issues. And so that's some of the top line data on the numbers. Um, we have been working to find collection rate data uh, because often uh, misdemeanors come with financial penalties. And that's where the Fines and Fees Justice Center is really focused, right? It's, um, we, we see these sanctions, misdemeanor sanctions, fines and fees come instead of incarceration. But the collection rates across the country, we know are extremely low. We don't have a representative sample yet here in Nevada because a lot of courts have a hard time providing year-to-year -year collection data. And we're hoping that with the help of an entity such as the Sentencing Commission, we will be able to get a much more robust and comprehensive sample of that data. But we've been working with Reno Municipal Court uh, and uh, some of the Reno City Council members to take a look and see how we can address some of these issues in Reno. And what we see with year-to-year -year collection rates for misdemeanors in Reno, and these are non-traffic misdemeanors. We've, this whole, everything we've talked about is the non-traffic misdemeanors. So we're looking at a collection rate in fiscal year 18-19 of 48%. 51 in 1920, and 41% in 2021. So out of the money assessed for these f fees that come with misdemeanors, less than half is being collected. And again, it's, uh, Kentucky helped set this up for us where they talked about how people were unable to post a $50 to $25 bond. We see that in Nevada as well, where people who are getting these low-level misdemeanors, are they get a ticket, it's got a couple hundred dollars, maybe up to $500 in fines and fees. They're unable to pay these. If they want to get on a payment plan, there's an extra charge for that. What we see is a lot of individuals looking at these fines, realizing they're unable to pay them, and simply not paying them, to the point where year to year, we're not even collecting half of the money that we are assessing. Where you compare that same court's collection rates to their traffic, 72% dropped during the pandemic to 65% and back up to 72%. So significantly higher collection rates when we're talking about traffic citations. And so we have, and we will propose towards the end, some solutions that we believe can, one, help us continue to hold individuals accountable, but also make sure that the, the financial penalties are structured in such a way 
that the individuals are able to pay them, and we can have, we will see an, incle an increase in those collection rates. And so that is some of the top line data that just helps us understand kind of what we're looking at, uh, how big the system is, and some areas where it seems to be failing. And we will pass it down now to um, our partners in Las Vegas. Uh, thank you. Um, Madam Chair, uh, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee specifically, uh, Assembly members, Summers Armstrong, Wynn, and Marzola down here, down south. Uh, for the record, uh, my name is Nathaniel Waugh. I'm the Manager of Policy, Advocacy, and Training for the Nevada Homeless Alliance. Uh, it is impossible to discuss uh, misdemeanors without examining the disproportionate burden placed on homeless individuals specifically through local ordinances. Uh, local jurisdictions have passed ordinances meant to punish individuals from camping, standing, lying down, loitering, and even food sharing. While the resources for enforcement of these ordinances has been easy for local jurisdictions to find, uh, finding the resources to enact long-term and sustainable solutions to homelessness in our communities has not been given the same priority. Based on the 2021 point in time count, it is estimated that on any given night, 13,076 individuals are experiencing homelessness in Clark County. 49% uh, of these individuals suffer from substance abuse, 38% with mental health concerns, and 25% with developmental disabilities. Rather than investing in increasing infrastructure to give these individuals help, we are citing them, fining them, and arresting them, creating a cycle of fines, imprisonment, release, rinse and repeat that is nearly impossible for them to break out of. These ordinances demonstrate nothing more than prejudice against the unhoused and the belief that being homeless is a crime to be punished for and not a situation to be lifted out of. In their 2019 report, Housing Not Handcuffs, the National Homelessness Law Center has three key findings worth noting. Criminalization of homelessness results in fines and fees that perpetuate the cycle of poverty. Uh, financial obligations, such as from fines and fees for using a tent or vehicle to shelter oneself, can prolong the amount of time that a person with will experience homelessness and can also leave homeless people less able to pay for food, transportation, medication, or other necessities. Civil and court imposed fines and fees can also prevent a person from being accepted into housing or even result in their incarceration for failure to pay them. Criminalization of homelessness harms public safety. Criminalization policies divert law enforcement resources from true street crime, clog our criminal justice system with unnecessary arrests, and fill already overcrowded jails. They also erode trust between homeless people and the police, heightening the risk of violent confrontations between police and unhoused people, and leaving homeless people more vulnerable to private acts of violence without police protection. This is why the Federal Department of Justice has filed statement of interest briefs and issued guidance arguing against the enforcement of criminalization ordinances in the absence of adequate alternatives. Criminalization of homelessness and encampment evictions harm public health. City officials frequently cite concerns for public health as a reason to enforce criminalization laws and or to evoke homeless encampments, a practice often referred to as a sweep. But such practices threaten public health by dispersing people who have no, nowhere to discard food, waste, and trash, to expel bodily waste, or to clean themselves and their belongings to more areas of the city, but with no new services to meet their basic sanitation and waste disposal needs. Moreover, sweeps often result in the destruction of homeless people's tents and other belongings used to provide shelter from the elements, cause stress, and cause loss of sleep, uh, contributing to worsened physical and mental health among an already vulnerable population. Due to these harms, the American Medical Association and American Public Health Association have both condemned criminalization and sweeps in policy resolutions. Uh, I join my fellow present presenters in supporting broader changes to the misdemeanor system, uh, but also urge this committee to examine limiting the ability of local jurisdictions to enact ordinances that specifically targets, or the enforcement of which disproportionately targets, individuals experiencing homelessness through appropriate legislation. Uh, thank you, and I'll turn it over to uh, Yvette Williams. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Scheibel, for accommodating us today. Truly appreciate it. And to the members of this committee for allowing us this opportunity to discuss such an urgent and important issue that's long gone uh, uh, un unresolved. Uh, I would also like to respectfully acknowledge my own representative in Assembly District 10, Assemblywoman Wynn. Good to see you. 
Um, I'm not. I'm going to go a little quick because uh, my colleagues have already spoke a lot about why we're here today, and we certainly share and agree 150 percent with all of the comments before you. And so, for the sake of time, and so that folks can get to lunch, I'm going to try to keep this very, very brief. But I do want to just reemphasize a couple of things. One, we urgently need a review uh, and an assessment of the Nevada uh, misdemeanor system. We've had conversations with our district attorney and. Clark County, and he indic and, and and he even indicated that there are low-level misdemeanors that um, have been on the books for many years that probably need to be removed or reassessed, uh, and in some cases, um, quite out of date. Others, they're not even prosecuting, um, and uh, and he even welcomes uh, that opportunity. Uh, that's what he has expressed to us in our meetings with him. Uh, so there is support for this um, in the district attorney's office. Trauma uh, and impact to individuals and families uh, as a result of, mister, of a misdemeanor record um, it, it doesn't often provide uh, families or, or those uh, with that infraction a second chance. It impacts the opportunities to higher education, uh, secure housing, uh, employment opportunities, et cetera. Uh, mental health is already compromised due to stress related to poverty, lack of permanent housing, racial bias and discrimination, creates post-traumatic stress, trying to navigate a low-level misdemeanor that should not rise to the level of incarceration that often results in loss of employment, housing, and sometimes their children. We know that many misdemeanors are as a result of mental health, uh, and, and, and with a comprehensive review, we believe, hopefully, that we'll be able to identify what that impact looks like and how we can better serve our community uh, with uh, low-level misdemeanors. We have to consider how extreme low-level infractions destabilize uh, families, and, and they truly and are they truly just? Do these low-level misdemeanors reflect a fair and just punishment? And how does the misdemeanor system impact our students? At our recent African American Student Summit in November of last year, 96% of those attending said that they or someone they know had a mental health crisis. And 94% feel they are treated differently due to their race. It is our belief and data shows that the current system disproportionately impacts black, indigenous people of color, and the poor. Parents in jail for a low-level misdemeanor destabilizes families and disrupts students' ability to function and perform their best in school. And we believe that that is probably part of the behavioral problems that we continually see. This current misdemeanor system is not just. Often punishment is much greater than the infraction and perpetuates a cycle we know does not work. We are uh, sup strongly supporting this review. Uh, we also, I also want to just uh, state that uh, in last legislative session, uh, bills, uh, bill was passed, AB um, 166 uh, and others. Um, and we want to make sure that the, that the intent of that legislation is protected. Uh, and so we'd like to see some language changed uh, around the, that legislation passed last year. We're very concerned, and it goes directly to what we're talking about here with these misdemeanors. And also, um, the Clark County Black Caucus would like to ask this committee to implement policy that limits incarceration and detention uh, to, the, to the more serious cases. And that's something that I believe we can address in this next session prior to a review of the entire system. And with that, thank you so much for your time. And again, we appreciate um, your patience today and, and allowing us to move up on the agenda. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Williams and Nate. Um, I, this is Lisa Mosley, and I believe Ms. Williams was referring to Assembly Bill 116. Correct me if I'm wrong, that passed uh, last legislative session. And so as we close, we want to again thank the committee and all of the members for allowing us to make this presentation and listening to us. And we just, before we go, 
Um, we, all, we have some proposed solutions that we would like to share with the committee. Um, actually, Nick, if you want to take this, you can. Absolutely, Nick Shepak. Uh, yeah, so we are uh, happy here to share what we believe are some possible solutions, um, ways for us to move forward and address uh, some of the issues raised today. We also want to make sure that everyone is aware that we have a lot more to say about this and a lot more data, <laughs> and we are very happy to have these conversations both uh, offline uh, or in any format that, that anyone would be interested in. Um, so uh, the really one of our big solutions and what we think we needs to happen in the state is uh, that we task the Sentencing Commission with completing a comprehensive review of Nevada's misdemeanor system and provide them with the necessary resources to do so. As mentioned, this was done in Colorado. Uh, it had complete bipartisan support. Uh, they were able to go line by line through the misdemeanor, system, uh, through the misdemeanor code. It took a lot of time. Uh, they were able to collect the data necessary to, necessary to make data-driven solutions, and they were able to create a code that focused on public safety and eliminated a lot of the crimes that criminalize poverty. Well, when we first started looking into this, uh, we thought that we possibly could conduct such a review, uh, but the amount of data that is needed and the difficulty in getting it, we do believe that it is worth tasking um, an entity that has the resources and the ability to do it. Um, we have some more short-term solutions as well, uh, requiring, requiring the courts to offer an ability to pay assessment for misdemeanors and traffic citations. Um, there's multiple ways to do this, but it ensures that individuals who are cited and fined have the ability to pay those fines, and it is much easier to hold someone accountable when you know that they can pay. Um, we have developed a one of, we have developed one of these. Other states use these um, and it is um, a really good way to address the fact that right now we're collecting in some courts 30 percent of uh, our fines and fees through the system. We can also expand the definition of community service. Uh, Texas has the best model that we could find for community service. They've expanded community service to include things like uh, working with your child at their school, attending rehabilitation services. If you are unemployed, looking for a job counts towards your community service. And what Texas has found is that when they encourage people to get involved in their community, get involved with their family, and take and do things to make their lives better, which either getting employed or taking courses so that they can become more employable, they reduce levels of crime, people spend their time well, and people are more willing to engage with the community service process. And we've even had some conversations with rural judges uh, or rural defense counsel where their clients, if they take community service, maybe they can pick up trash in one area they, um, they, they wash the police cars, but you have to wait. Um, you, can't, you can only do that so often. And the, the, the ability to conduct community service in some of our rural areas is very difficult. And by expanding that definition, we can give more people the opportunity to do that community service. Um, we suggest that we restrict the court's ability to charge a fee to enter into a payment plan for both traffic and misdemeanor uh, fines and fees. Right now, anywhere from $20 to over $100 is charged to an individual who is unable to afford their fines and fees if they want to get on a payment plan. This is a fee that is only charged to people who have an inability to pay at the time that they are sentenced. If you can pay your fine and fee, you're paying what it is. If you are uh, living in poverty, if you just don't have all the money right away, you have to pay these additional fees to get on. It looks to us like a poor people tax. Um, there's no other real way to look at it. Um, we, as Nate mentioned, uh, regulating local jurisdictions authority to create misdemeanors that specifically target or disproportionately affect in, uh, individuals experiencing homelessness would have a great impact in us dealing with what has 
we can all agree has become a crisis with the unsheltered. And unfortunately, uh, we did not have mass liberation here today with us. Uh, Leslie Turner was supposed to be here with us today. Um, but when we're talking about things like the justice reinvestment, um, the coordinating, the local coordinating councils, or um, any all these bodies that deal with criminal justice reform recommendations, uh, we have we continually push for this. But we deeply believe that individuals who are directly impacted, whether they are people who have experienced the misdemeanor system, people who are formerly incarcerated, uh, should be placed either in seats on those boards or in commissions that deal directly with them so that we can ensure uh, that impacted individuals. And this also includes individuals who are victims of crime too. We often put people who represent these individuals on these boards without actually having the individuals themselves have the input. Um, and so those are things we believe we can do this next session. We had a few notes. Uh, that we wanted to mention since we're here about AB 116 uh, traffic decrim. A few things that we've heard uh, that we believe need clarifying. Um, we know that there's probably some um, cleanup language coming, uh, but a few things that have been brought to our attention. One uh, uh, brought to us by the AOC is that um, it isn't exactly clear if an online ability to do a pay assessment would be allowed. Uh, that if somebody was unable to pay their ticket and they wanted to, to have that discussion, that they would have to challenge the ticket. Um, however, uh, we do not believe that was the intent of the legislation. You shouldn't, uh, people can be both admitting guilt and needing to let the court know that they cannot pay the ticket in full. Uh, so possibly some language to clean that up. There's also some confusion around driver's license suspension. Two there was a piece of legislation that ran that ended driver's license to suspension. Uh, there's something in 116 that mentions driver's license suspension, and different courts are having different readings. Some believe that starting on the first of next year, they will be able to uh, start suspending driver's licenses again. And that was clearly not the intent of the two pieces of legislation um, that were passed last session. Uh, and lastly, there is a section in 116 that requires you to post a bond before you challenge uh, the ticket. And uh, we don't, one, believe that's legal, but uh, we also uh, believe that anyone who wants to dispute a ticket should not have to post a bond prior to disputing the ticket. Now, there is an argument that moving forward past that if you want to um, if you want to challenge the decision on your initial challenge uh, that possibly a bond could be necessary but uh, you should not have to put down any money in order to uh, challenge a ticket and do you have anything to add to that Mr. Lisa Mosley I do I want to share with the committee that in coming up with these solutions particularly um, tasking the Sentencing Commission, our ask of tasking the Sentencing Commission with doing a full review of the misdemeanor system. We considered other ways to do that, including establishing an independent uh, review committee of local organizations or agencies. Um, but after having these conversations with amongst ourselves and our partners, we came up with the um, con we came to the conclusion that the Sentencing Commission probably would be the best way to do this. They have the resources to collect the data that we think is necessary um, to make any reforms once the review is completed. They have um, excellent staff and folks that are sitting on that committee. We do believe that, as Nick um, said earlier, that um, that committee could be expanded to maybe include more people that are directly impacted um, so that those voices are considered as well. And just wanted to point that out, and we believe, again, that the Sentencing Commission is best equipped to be able to do this review. And we're hoping that once this review is complete, that it will lead to some of these reforms that we believe will make us more in line to make the system work for all of us in any way that it can. We are definitely asking for the cleanup language in AB 116, particularly around the driver license suspensions. As Nick mentioned, courts believe that as of January 1st, they will be able to 
resume suspending driver's licenses. And the intent of this bill was not to do that, not to be in conflict with a Senate Bill 219, which also passed in the 2021 legislative session. We have heard from the Department of Motor Vehicles and their officials, and they are also of the opinion that they will begin resuming driver license suspensions as of January 1, 2023. And we know that that was not in the intent of either of these bills, so we're asking for that cleanup language. We're also asking, um, as part of the cleanup language for Assembly Bill 116, that um, um, we, Nick mentioned, no fee for um, payment plans. And so we just want to make sure, I just want to reiterate that and make sure that um, we are looking at that. And with that, I think we are equipped to take any questions that the committee might have. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, I don't think we have any questions uh, here in Carson City. I will go down to Las Vegas. Any questions from our committee members in Las Vegas? I have a question, Chair. Um, thank you for that presentation. I appreciate that. Um, obviously, I think everyone here, um, those two bills passed pretty um, solidly um, across party lines um, to do that. So. Um, I have also been informed that the reading of that is that the license suspensions could resume come January 1st, 2023. And I can say I don't believe that was anyone's <laughs> intention. So if that's something that we need to, do need to correct, I appreciate you guys constantly um, following up on that <clears throat> to make sure that the legislative intent is followed. Um, second of all, you had talked about Colorado, uh, Mr. Shepak, and um, do they have a unified court system? Nick Shepak, for the record, um, Colorado does indeed have a unified court system. And then short of, um, you know, establishing a unified court system, are there any jurisdictions that have looked to address or readdress their um, misdemeanor sentencing structures or anything like that that are in non-unified court systems? Nick Sheepak, for the record, um, I will look into that more. There is misdemeanor reform happening around the country. Nothing has been quite as robust as what has recently happened in Colorado, which was a complete review um, of the system but there is reforms happening across the country and I will find which ones are occurring in the non-unified systems and uh, report that back to the committee. Thank you, and then I just have a couple of other questions that I think you'll be able to answer. Um, I appreciate the fact that I think we're most successful here when we are making evidence-based decisions, so I appreciate your suggestion to um, have a sentencing commission, which review sentencing, <laughs> um, I think that would be an appropriately housed, um, you know, agency or group or commission to look at that. Is that similar to what they did in Colorado and how long was that process of evaluating the different sentences to come up with, you know, the recommendations that were ultimately adopted? Nick Sheepak, for the record, yes, they have a very similar commission. It is not called a sentencing commission, but it is a sitting commission that deals with criminal justice reform. What they did, it's a very large commission, even larger than the sentencing commission. Um, what they did is they created a subcommittee, um, and then they had an even smaller committee underneath that, um, made up of uh, defense counsel, uh, prosecutors, law enforcement, some legislators. Uh, they went, it took them a little under two years. They went um, line by line. They had uh, the information on um, on how many, on, on each crime, how many were tried, what the outcomes war, were. They went line by line through the misdemeanor system. Uh, they had those discussions, debates with each other uh, over a little over a year period um, where they, and then they, made their recommendations. They were bipartisan recommendations. They brought them from the smaller subcommittee up to the whole committee. Um, they presented them over multiple meetings to the larger committee. The larger committee uh, made some minor changes, but nothing major. Uh, and then they were able to bring that to the legislature as a recommendation. Uh, the recommendations I, I have provided, it's a pretty 
um, large packet. They made their complete recommendations to the legislature. So it was really about a two-year process before they got in front of the legislature. They were able to pass them without any amendments because the work that had been done had been uh, so thoroughly vetted and bipartisan that the bill passed without any uh, amendments. And then just one follow-up question, and this may be something I will have to follow up with the Department of Sentencing Policy. Um, obviously, in this date, this sounds kind of like a similar process that we went through with um, 2019 legislation, Assembly Bill 236. Um, and we learned then that we had to have people that went through each individual judgment of conviction, every individual pre-sentence investigation report, in order to collect some of this information. Do you anticipate with the fact that we don't have a unified court system that any recommendations to a sentencing policy, um, you know, to fund that collection of data? I mean. That seems like a very intense process. Where, did they collect everything on all misdemeanors, or did they limit it to certain types of misdemeanor collection? Because you would probably have to do a hand search of most of that data. Nick Sheepak, for the record. Um, yeah, it, I agree fully that it, it sounds like a daunting task. Uh, do I necessarily believe that we have the access to the same level of data that they had in Colorado? Um, no. Uh, I can find out exactly what data they had. I've had conversations with the people on the committee. Uh, it has been a minute exactly what they had for each individual crime. I do not know. I know they brought in experts uh, in each area as they took uh, sections of crime, so they had those discussions, whether it was misdemeanors dealing with wildlife or fish and game, things like that. They would bring in individuals. What the Sentencing Commission would have to collect for us to do this um, is a discussion that I think we need to have. I, I don't know that we, we have ideas. I don't know that we know fully what they will need. I do know that the uh, local coordinating council that is under that is in the Department of Sentencing is in the pro, um, has individuals that are in contact with the courts and we and should be able to find out what information is actually available and until we bolster our data collection here in Nevada or hopefully one day unify the court system um, we are probably going to have to operate with as much data as we can and accept that it is never going to be fully complete. Uh, this is Lisa Mosley. I do have just a, a comment about data. Um, as you may know, data has been incredibly challenging to collect. Um, as an example, we submitted a records request to the Nevada Department of Corrections for some work that we're going to be doing with Return Strong, which is a reentry organization. And the, though the request was quite um, extensive, we were told that we would not be able to get that data for at least seven months. And the problem with that is we know that some of the data was already provided for the state audit committee committee that did a recent audit of the Nevada Department of Corrections. So we know some of that data is readily available, but we have not been able to get it. So I just wanted to point that out so that you all know that why we are trying to get this data and why we think uh, the Sentencing Commission might be best tasked for that, because um, just on our own, uh, with records requests, it's been incredibly challenging to obtain the data that we feel is necessary. Thank you. Other questions down in Las Vegas? All right, I'm not seeing any. Do we have questions from the members who joined us online today? No one's chiming in, but I also can't see them. So I want to make sure with BPS that we're still connected. I have a question, please, Chair. All Assemblywoman right. Krautner. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for your presentation, uh, Mr. Shepak. Um, I was just wondering about Assembly Bill 440 from the 2021 Nevada Legislative Session. I believe that bill dealt with uh, it, issuing citations in lieu of arrest for misdemeanors. And I was just 
wondering uh, if, if that was in, playing any part in in your presentation now and, and what you're um, thinking of for the future for the 2023 legislative session and, and your thoughts on how that's rolling out. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question, uh, Nick Sheepak, for the record. Um, Right, so the idea of uh, citation in lieu of arrest uh, is one part of possible reform moving forward. And I think a comp we, uh, some crimes had been identified uh, as ones that should be uh, citation in lieu of arrest. Um, I haven't received enough data yet on how that's working to see how um, it's going. We do think that citation in lieu of arrest is a, is a part of reform. Really, we see uh, a comprehensive review leading to a few things. One, um, while uh, I'm always reluctant to say that we should ever raise penalties, I do believe that there are probably some misdemeanors that collectively we would agree on should be bumped up to gross misdemeanors, something like that. So there would be an actual raising of some. I believe there would be a bifurcation of some crimes. In Colorado, what we saw is that it was a uh, low, uh, it was a felony, um, grand theft auto, uh, if you took a car and took it to a chop shop, or if you took a car for a joyride and ditched it. One, so what they did is they bifurcated that crime, uh, making it a high level misdemeanor for joyriding and they kept the uh, theft with intent to sell or destroy a vehicle as a felony. Uh, I see then there's decriminalization, uh, which would be moving things into the civil system that we have created for traffic. And then there is legalization, which is when we decide that some crimes do not belong on the books. Um, and then there's citation in lieu of arrest, which is where we keep something criminal, uh, but we remove the ability to arrest. And I think what we need is, what we do need is more data. So I think that one thing we need to look at is how is that rolling out, like you suggested, right? The ones that we have moved to citation in lieu of arrest. Is that working? Um, is that creating, is that not, is that adding to public safety? Is, Right, and if it is, then can we expand that model while continuing to have a focus on public safety? Um, but I see that as well as all these other moving parts as the possible outcomes. But I think we need um, significantly more data for me to comfortably say what's going to be best for public safety uh, and what's going to be best for the community. This is Lisa Mosley. I'd like to offer a comment to the Assemblywoman as well. I am not as familiar with um, SB 440, I believe it's SB 440 or AB 440, in citation in lieu of arrest. But what I would offer is that many of the misdemeanor infractions that we talk about um, do come with the citations. For example, traffic citations. Um, though an officer could arrest someone, most times we know that they don't. And even though they are issued a citation, it's often the fines and the fees that come with those citations later that present the most harm to people who those citations are issued to. And so with that, is, that is one of the reasons we are asking for the review to see which ones um, of those misdemeanors are people most often being cited or charged with and how those misdemeanors, um, the long-term effects of those misdemeanors are playing out. So it's not always the act of being arrested for those misdemeanors, it's the citation. And oftentimes it's the interaction or the contact with law enforcement that sometimes creates those possible violent interactions later on down the line. So it's not always just the arrest, it's also just the, the foray into the misdemeanor system with that citation, that is where the harm, uh, we see the harms beginning and the long-term effects also beginning. So I hope that just offers some insight to that as well. Well, thank you, Ms. Mosley and Mr. Shepak. Um, well, number one, I'd really like to hear more I information uh, if you can find it or, or if you can work with law enforcement or our district attorneys or public defenders and finding out how that is rolling out. It's AB 440 from the 2021 legislative session. And I, and I have to respectfully disagree with you. I do think that um, people that are being arrested might uh, experience PTSD or trauma from just the act of being arrested. Um, and, and yes, fines and fees just uh, add on top of that for people that can't afford to pay it, but I, I think it's both. 
Uh, Lisa Mosley, I absolutely will agree with you. I absolutely will agree with you. But also just reiterate that even for the folks that don't see arrest, um, we do the long-term effects of those often are in some cases just as harmful. But I absolutely will agree with you. And um, that is absolutely the reason why we want to look at this and get this review and see where we can make some of those changes or we can minimize those effects as much as we can. Thank you, ma'am. All right, thank you. I'm not seeing any more questions from our colleagues online in Carson or in Las Vegas. Um, I have just a brief question to, to follow up on the AB 440 discussion. Um, and I think we probably need more data, but when people are issued a citation, they're given a court date. When they don't make that court date, um, I'm assuming bench warrants are generally issued. And I'm wondering if other jurisdictions have come up with um, a workaround for, you know, it, how often are we just putting off the arrest? So they might not be arrested that when they get the citation, but then they're later arrested after they've missed their court date. Is there an alternative? There has to be an alternative to that. So I guess my question is, what is that alternative? Uh, Lisa Mosley, for the record, yes. Um, we can certainly look into other jurisdictions that around the country, I mean, our organization works with um, courts and jurisdictions around the country. So we can certainly look for that data and look for um, any information on that and provide that to you. But we know that some jurisdictions send, if someone misses a court date, they send a notice out to them and say, hey, you missed a court date. Um, is there something going on? We know that even in our own state of Carson City, you know, they decriminalized, basically, essentially decriminalized traffic tickets in 2019 and had a system in place where if someone misses a court date or misses a payment, they do send them a notice. And so we can look to our own state for examples of how that is working. Excellent. Thank you. All right, and now I'm not seeing anything further. So uh, we will thank the Fines and Fees Justice Center for your presentation and for your partners down in um, Las Vegas who helped out. Uh, we are going to take our lunch break at this point. Uh, I, I think that was a sigh of relief that I heard next to me. Um, we're a little bit after 1 p.m., so um, let's come back a little bit before 2 p.m. Um, I will be back here by 145 and when we have a quorum we will reconvene and um, I will see you all then. Thanks. So we're in recess just for the record. <laughs>